Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this, the Sunset Safari on the 8th day of February, I think it is, uh, 2016, Anno Domini AD, or the Common Era, depending on your persuasion. My name is James Hendry. Andrew's on camera. Hello, Andrew. Hello there. Yes, yeah, nice to see you, Andrew. Um, starting to look a little bit like Bigfoot now with the amount of facial hair that he's got, but that's okay. And in the final control, we've got Geraldine on the vocals and Kirsty on the keys. That's a call to alliteration, Andrew. And on the other vehicle is Jamie, and she is being driven, but no, she's not, she's actually doing the driving. Brian is going to film her. Right, uh, we are starting this drive with a tree because we couldn't find any animals. That's not actually true. We did see a few animals here, but I wanted to show you this because we've had a few questions about the Inkahuma pride. Now, Inkahuma, as I was taught a few days ago by Sarah in Ohio, who seems to have a better knowledge of Tsonga botany than I do, which is embarrassing in the extreme, uh, informed me that Inkahuma means brown ivory tree. Now, this, I mentioned, I showed you a brown ivory tree, and then I said the other ivory that we get is a red ivory, and it grows along the drainage lines. And that's precisely what this is. It's a red ivory tree, and the most obvious sort of feature about its leaves You're a bit are... close for me to focus. I'm a bit close, right. How's that, Andrew? Fussy. It's still a bit close. <laughs> that's better. Right, the most obvious feature of this leaf, if you happen to be out here wanting to identify a red ivory tree, Burkemia zaire, is the herringbone nature of the venation. And you can see it's indented on the top or dorsal side of the leaf. See that, Andrew? Yes. Oh, good. Well done. Now, um, you are on a live safari, believe it or not. I know that there have been a number of uh, doubting Thomases over the last little while. They're new viewers. It's wonderful to have you on board, especially if you're a new viewer. Please talk to us, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv. It would be wonderful to hear from you. And the only other thing I want to show you is um, that Andrew has brought himself a snack. Uh, he's half eaten it. Uh, it's melted. And that I'm showing you, it's melted, of course, because it is 31 degrees Celsius, which is actually quite a pleasant um, temperature, 88 degrees Fahrenheit. But it is not so good if you're having a peanut butter flavored uh, cereal bar snack for your tea. Right. Jamie is going towards the lions. So let's hope she finds them. We are going to the far east to see what we can find there. Uh, perhaps some Singapore noodles. Uh, we'll see. I know the Birmingham boys were lurking about in Torchwood today, and I was rather hoping, possibly, probably, vainly, that they would have come across. Um, it's been a lovely day. It hasn't been, it hasn't been sort of too hot. So they may have moved, but I don't think so. We'll see. There'll be interesting things to find on the way, quite regardless of whether the Birmingham boys are there or not. So I hope wherever you are in the world, you are having a very pleasant time of it. Of course, uh, it is now... Now, Tuesday, if you happen to be in the, the west eastern part of Australia, it is uh, still, well, it's, I'm not sure what it is in Hawaii. It might actually still be, it can't be Sunday in Hawaii, can it, Andrew? Do you know? I'm sure it's just very early Monday morning in Hawaii, and then in most of the continental United States, of course, it is now Monday morning. For us here at Wild Earth, Monday morning does not represent too much of a trial because it's exactly the same as Sunday morning, Saturday morning, Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, and Tuesday mornings. We get to go out into the bush, find a couple of animals, show them to you, answer your questions, have a good chat about the different things that we're seeing, and that's basically what we call work. Um, it's rather nice, really, that we can call that work. I know some of you... Virtual snarling. I know some of you watch this while you're at the office, which, of course, if you're in a corporate job, you definitely should be doing, especially in meetings. Now, that is a virtual starling, one of the three glossy starling species that we get here. It has a black eye. Well done, Andrew. Good job. Oh, he's still there. Can you see him? He's that big blue thing sitting on a tree. 
lies on the ground. He'll be feeding on some insects. He's got a very obvious insect-eating beak. And what I, I was chatting, it must have been yesterday afternoon, when we were finding nothing but dust and a bit of old dung, um, that my mother once did a birding course. She was very enthusiastic at one stage. And the other thing that you note when you see a bird other than its size. Remember yesterday we did size. It's either the size of a guinea fowl, a chicken, a sparrow, or a crow. I think that was how it was described. The next thing you look at is the size or the shape of its beak. And that beak, that kind of fairly classical sort of a beak, is an insect-eating beak. Naturally not showing it to us now, but you get the conical seed-eating beak of a finch. Everybody knows what a finch looks like. You get the meat-eating beak of a raptor, and of course then the specialized beaks of uh, sort of nectar feeders, like the hummingbirds or the sunbirds that we get here. All righty then, let's go across to Jamie. She has, I think, I'm not sure, she might be with a carpet of cats. Let's go and find out from her, and I will continue far east. See you later. And this afternoon, not a carpet of cats, but I know that James was talking about the Inkuhuma tree. And now we are with the Inkuhuma pride. They are exceptionally unsettled. They were a little bit this morning on the sunrise safari, and it's even more so this afternoon. I'm giving them a, an exceptional amount of personal space. We drove in as we normally would, and that one female this morning, the one female was incredibly unsettled. And as soon as we came within about 50 meters of them, she got up and ran from us. I approached them as I would always do, which was at a very steady speed. I'm not sure what it is exactly that's happened in her life recently that's made her as uncomfortable as she is. It's the female with a scar across her back. But unfortunately, what that does mean, I think, and because they're moving into thick vegetation, is that I'm actually going to leave the sighting and let them just relax a bit for now. I don't want to push them. It's very, very dense vegetation around here. And I'm uncertain as to what exactly is going on with her. I don't know if it's hormonal or if something's happened to her. Maybe she was on a main road and a vehicle came around too fast and scared her a little bit. And she's now associating vehicles with that. But I think it's just a slow process of getting them to relax a bit because she is uncomfortable. I'm gonna see just inch forward to see if they're still in the shade. We've given them, as you can see, plenty of personal space but good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and welcome to the sunset safari my name is jamie i have brian on camera with me and it will be forever one of those mysteries as to what is happening with that particular lioness and i'm sure it's nothing too serious she's just a little bit uncomfortable and it's always important to remember that as wild animals we're in their space we're in their home and it's just necessary to give them plenty of respect in that particular instance. Trying to see where they've gone. I think they're probably lying down in the shade. There they are. So I'll get us a nice view without stressing them further. But unfortunately, it's not our usual perspective on the lions, but that is just how we're going to be for this afternoon. As I said, something's upset them. I don't know what it is. Maybe it was an elephant that came through and scared them. <laughs> Maybe there's some other reason. Whatever it is, we're just going to take the messages that they've passed on to us, which was just fear. They were exhibiting fear, which they've never ever done to me with this vehicle before. Picked up a little bit of it this morning. Hey ladies, what's happening in your life? <coughs> there it is, amber eyes. Three of them are perfectly relaxed and more than comfortable. It's just that one female that's causing stress with the other three. But nice to see the four ladies together. The fifth one is off with the Birmingham boys in Torchwood. She's with all five Birminghams at the moment, but only mating with one of them, as far as we know. As to where Amber Eyes disappeared off to, I have no idea. She apparently 
only just come back sometime last night or early this morning and rejoined the group. And don't forget that we are live, which means that everything has to be done unscripted and unpredictably. And this afternoon, they're just that little bit uncomfortable with us. Uh, the Styx Pride were last seen on Gari Main Junction Cheetah Cutline. They then moved further south into Chitwa, as far as I knew, where they killed a buffalo and were feeding and then moving between the kill and the dam. But Safari Dean has raised an interesting point. He wants to know if the Inkahumas might be unsettled because of the Styx Pride moving in. It's always a possibility. Um, I don't think so, though, in this particular instance. I think they've, they are fairly far apart. They're about probably six or seven kilometers, if not more which is about three or four miles. Hello, girls. You can just see in their body language, even though they are lying down, there's something unsettled about them. Your heads are constantly turning, ears constantly flicking and looking around. Now, our regular viewers will know that the lions of the Sabi Sands generally are perfectly relaxed with vehicles. They've been raised in that manner. In this particular instance, it's very unusual to see them so uncomfortable. And I think what I am going to do is I'm going to pull out of the sighting for now. Let them just relax a bit. Oh, flopped. Oh, there we go. Starting to calm down. Interesting behavior. But yes, I might do a little drive around the block and then come back to them and see if they're feeling any better about our presence. Certainly a new, this is a new experience for me with these lions and any lions actually in this area. Let's go and head out and find other things and then come back to them a little bit later. They have relaxed and the one thing that you've got to slowly do in situations like this is I think just get them more and more comfortable with the presence of the vehicle. And I do think we can come back to them later this afternoon. I think it just will give them a little bit of personal space for now and then see how they do when we come back. Let them just feel comfortable and let them know that their message was received. And while we do that, Darlene was wondering, and we spoke about amber eyes and then the older lioness with the scar on her back that's actually causing the skittish response from these lions. Darlene was wondering, is there a female within a lion pride that actually takes the lead and is generally the most dominant one? And the answer is usually, yes, there is. It's one of the older females. In certain situations, that older female can be accompanied by an older a sister with her of the same age. So very often it's quite difficult to determine exactly who is the most dominant within a pride. Usually the older ones take the lead just because they have the experience in terms of hunting and anything like that. So you can see it uh, with the Inkahuma pride. It seems as though Amber Eyes generally initiates most of the movements and the hunts along with this female with the scar across her back. Now, from what I can tell, there's three older females and... No, wait, sorry. There's two older females and two younger females. And then the young sub-adult female. And it seems as though generally the responsibility is mostly on amber eyes, but split between her and the older female. And my plan is really just to drive around the block, see if maybe there's another reason for their distress, see if there's any other lions in the area. Maybe they've caught the scent of it, which is possible. Now, this morning, Brent said that he saw male tracks. He saw tracks of a single male walking around Gowrie Cut Line. Now, that could also be an explanation for their skittish behavior. It could be that they either encountered him last night or they had an encounter with the hyena clan because they definitely had a kill a very very close basically within the same block which is what we refer to an area that's surrounded by roads in basically in the same block is a mouse bird i wonder if it'll stick around for us to get it on camera oh nope <laughs> that was hopeful 
can still see them in the top of that buffalo thorn. I haven't managed to put one of those on camera in a while. There's a whole flock of them that's just flown. Can you see them there, Brian? On top of the buffalo thorn. There we go. And the one on the right. A red-faced mouse bird for you. And the name mouse birds sort of comes from this idea that they're rather mouse-like in behavior. The way that they tuck themselves together to roost at night and those tiny little bodies. There we go, Brian's managed to get you a bit of a view of the colors. And they're enjoying the fruiting buffalo thorns, which are giving rise to beautiful red berries that the birds are absolutely loving at the moment. There you go, you can see that streak of red across the eyes. One of the only common mouse bird species to see around here. And incidentally, I'm sure I've told the story before about my pet baby mouse bird many, many, many years ago, when I was very young, that I attempted to smuggle into school repeatedly and hand fed from a very small size. I used to try and hide it underneath my ponytail and sneak it into school. Unfortunately, baby birds are not the most silent of animals. And I was eventually caught out. And when I say eventually, I was probably caught out about four hours later when the teacher finally decided to ask me why I was hiding a bird that was then defecating down my back of my school uniform and hiding underneath my hair. Luckily for me, she was very sympathetic and understanding and allowed me to bring it into school and to feed it despite the disruption that it probably caused to everybody's lessons. Awesome. Here we go. So a red-faced mouse bird. And for maybe for some new viewers, that might be one to add to your bird list. <laughs> So for new viewers, we always encourage viewers to keep a bird list. And Claudia, who's been keeping hers for the last month, is already on 39 birds. I can't remember this. I can't remember what the record is for one of our viewers, but it's definitely over 200. 225, there we go. 225 is the record, I believe unless some of you have been keeping quiet about your bird lists and just getting them even higher up and waiting for the moment to surprise us. I know that Brent is competing with all of you. He's got his live bird list going as well. You could have, potentially, you could actually see easily somewhere in the region of about, I would say at least over 300 bird species while you watch these live shows. Some of them are trickier than others. Those little brown sparrows and little brown pipits and larks and cesticulas are sort of cryptically colored little birds that like to hide away. So those are the challenges. But we've got such a vast, beautiful array of bird life. And it's one of the things that we love about these live safaris. The fact that we can hopefully pique an interest or encourage an interest in not necessarily just the high profile animals. And yes, we love those too and we enjoy every moment spent with them. But still, thoroughly, being able to thoroughly appreciate not just them, but the world around you makes for a far more rounded safari experience. The elephants have walked through here. So that could be one of the reasons for the lion's skittish behavior. is a nice example of a buffalo thorn that is currently fruiting in order to show you those berries that the mouse birds were munching on. I think, however, I will avoid getting out of the car for a moment due to the presence of this gentleman. Watch out, boy. The Inkahumas are in town. He could be a little bit big for the four lionesses, but you never know. 
They are very well-practiced buffalo killers. I think, however, this gentleman is probably large enough to be safe from their attentions. Without the presence of junior and a somewhat reduced number of lions within the pride, they've generally been targeting the smaller sub-adult buffalo. There's definitely been a difference in their difference in their hunt in their hunting strategy. But before I noticed this gentleman, I was going to try and find you some buffalo thorn berries to show you. It's one of the late fruiting trees out here. There's also the sour plums should be ripe, ripening soon. And both of those in answer to Valerie's question, who was wondering if human beings can eat the berries of the buffalo thorn. Yes, you can. In the same way you can eat the leaves. Um, I have to confess, Valerie, I think it's one of the few berries that I haven't eaten. I might give it a good taste, see what I think of it. Always important to be very aware of the fact that not everything out here that is consumed by animals is consumable by humans. Particularly, you've got to be particularly careful of following monkeys and baboons and assuming that whatever they consume is safe for people. Generally, monkeys are capable, or generally monkeys' diet is closer to ours than baboons' is in terms of what they can tolerate. But even then, I would suggest avoiding the test, unless you know something is safe to eat, the best way to approach it is rub a little bit on the inside of your arm and see if you have any kind of reaction to it. But even then, I think it's unlikely that you're going to be in that kind of necessary survival situation. Now, we've got a huge prey species of the lion here, but James has found one of the smallest antelope species. Let's have a look. So we're very luckily sitting here and this little Steenbok ewe has not run away from us, which is something of a miracle. And she's being very confiding, just walking along. And the interesting thing about her, compared with the great big buffalo bull that you were looking at with Jamie, is uh, mostly that, of course, this Steenbok is built rather like Jamie. I'm not built like a buffalo bull. I just thought I'd throw that in there. But the most interesting thing about this is that it is what is known as a concentrate feeder. Now that means that it has to look for fairly rich food, often quite sort of carbohydrate rich, sometimes a bit of fat in the, in the or not fat, so oils in the bulbs and tubers that it might try and eat. It will eat fruits, it will eat the buds on trees which contain the nutrients that will eventually supply the leaves. And the reason for that is that it has what we call a very high metabolic rate in relation to its size. So while the total amount of food that that buffalo you were watching eats is far greater, obviously, than the Steenbok's, the amount eaten per gram of mass is much smaller for the buffalo than it is for the Steenbok. So if you're following me this far, the reason for that is because a smaller animal loses heat and therefore struggles to maintain heat much more than a big animal. And that means per gram of its mass, it must eat more food and more concentrated food. So were the Steenbok to go around eating what the buffalo eats, which is sort of a fairly distasteful dry grass in an unselective manner, it would quickly starve. It must find much more nutrient-rich food. And the problem, of course, goes even further if you happen to be a mouse or something like that, perhaps the rat that lives or used to live in Andrew's room. Um, it, that has to eat very concentrated food, so they will look for seeds especially and insects and things like that which contain lots of food so that they can maintain their body temperatures. I hope you followed that. If you didn't, um, let me know and I'll try and explain it again. I find it fascinating and it's a concept that we call mass-specific metabolic rate. Mass-specific metabolic rate and the mass-specific metabolic rate of a smaller animal is exponentially higher than the mass specific metabolic rate of something like that buffalo you were watching with Jamie. Did you get all that, Andrew? Yes. Good. I'll ask you to explain it to me again over dinner, or you'll have only rice. Okay, we're on the. Ch um, I nearly said the Chinese border. Uh, <laughs> we're in the 
far eastern border, and I don't know why I never said that. I'm sure if I'm losing my mind. And we have found no sign of the Birmingham boys, nor have we found any outlets for Singapore noodles or um, kung fu chicken or whatever it is that you call it. We're going to head towards Biffleshook Dam now and see what we can find there. So let's carry, carry on our way. I must say I'm rather astonished by those lions and their behavior. It really does seem to me very strange indeed, and I'm sure Jamie has got some explanations for it. I have absolutely no explanation for it at all, except to say that when Brian and I were watching him the other day, not too far from where we are now, there were only three of them, they were just not as comfortable. I don't know if you remember, if you happen to be watching, one of them, in fact, the same one with a scar on her back, kept sitting up and kind of looking like that, and we assumed it was the storm coming in or perhaps the lightning flashing out of those black clouds. But I don't know that it was now. I'm beginning to think that maybe it was the vehicle, maybe it was us moving around on the car, you know, the normal stuff with, with Brian moving around and Andrew moving around, and maybe that's what it was. So, I don't know, it's rather interesting. Okay, while we are driving along here, looking at not very much, Jamie has managed to find herself with Chelonid. Let's head across to that, and I'll catch up with you at the Zook Dam. I seem to have something of a pattern for finding tortoises trying to hide from me under bushes, and we've got this beautiful leopard tortoise as a nice example. It always fascinates me the way that they do that. As soon as they realize that they've been spotted, racing off into the nearest clump of grass, at which point they stick their head in it and then freeze, as if to say, you can't see me now. I have completely disappeared. I'm hidden in the grass. <laughs> this one's still trying to find its way in deeper. This morning it was a Speaks hinge tortoise that was doing it. This afternoon it's a quite a large leopard tortoise. And I've said before I'm not a... I wouldn't call myself a tortoise aging expert, but they do become more and more domed with age. In other words, that carapace or the shell tends to become more and more sort of curved, if that makes sense. It's much more flattened when they hatch, and this tortoise could easily be 20 years old. And those rings or growth sort of layers on the edge of the shell itself, those can be counted similar to the rings of a tree, but as I've said before, they do rub off with age, so it's not really an accurate representation of how old this tortoise is. But it's been very interesting. Maybe this tortoise knows something we don't. We've noticed that the frogs have been calling, the tortoises are out. As far as I know, <clears throat> there's absolutely no rain that's been predicted. Maybe that weather report is wrong, maybe the meteorologists have got it wrong, I have to be honest, I'd sooner put my money on the animals of the Sabi Sands rather than the weather service itself. And it has felt very strange <laughs> going further and further into the grass, bulldozing its way in there. But yes, usually you see tortoises coming out, tortoises, frogs, and the occasional other reptile generally tend to come out when it's just before it rains or just uh, afterwards. Maybe this tortoise has got it right. Maybe the rain is coming. Playing peekaboo with us through the grass. <laughs> and then ducking down. And it's a tough time for the tortoises during the drought. They've got to cover huge distances. They need water, just as all of animals do, and particularly the females do. They are capable of going for longer periods without it. And of course, they're capable of estivating, which is that period during which they just slow down their metabolism completely, not quite hibernating. What are you munching? You can see him either swallowing, I don't know if he's chewing something or if he's found something maybe to drink, I doubt it though. There's not much surface water left at this point. 
blinking away at us. <laughs> Hidden. Hide and seek behind the grass. Oh, just an update on my plans. Um, in terms of the Inkahumas, I've decided to leave them for now. I will return a little bit later to see whether or not they have relaxed and I'll return at a very sort of far distance and start reading their body language from there. But for now, the fact that they got up and actively ran away suggests to me that maybe they just need some time and some space to themselves for now. And I wonder whether it doesn't have something to do with those mail tracks that Brent found. So what I'm planning on doing is actually going to see if that mail makes an appearance. Interesting point that's come through from Dennis as we have a look at the clouds building up in the skies. And though maybe hopefully a little bit of rain that will come through eventually. Dennis, you were wondering if the if Junior was to decide to return, would his pride members act nervously or uncomfortably in perhaps out of fear that it would alert the attention of the Birmingham boys and cause them any kind of risk. And Dennis, you've got it spot on in that a young male lion is a danger for the presence of the females. And it's actually, funnily enough, one of the theories that we discussed, because we have noticed a bit of skittishness with the Inkahumas, and we were discussing whether or not it might have been the extended presence of Junior that's just made them nervous. And we sort of decided probably it wasn't, just because it's been quite a while since he moved out of home, so to speak. However, I think his returned presence... Uh, it's just a log. I've got lions on the brain now. I thought it was a lion lying down. <laughs> I think it's just a log. No, it's definitely just a log. Um, I think that they would react nervously. I think that they would be uncomfortable. I don't necessarily think that they would react aggressively. I think in the next few months, the longer he is away from them, the higher the chance is that they would be extremely uncomfortable with his presence. And probably he would react aggressively to them as well. It does get to the point where lions start to really distance, the males really start to distance themselves from their pride. That being said, um, if one of the females came into estrus, despite the fact that they are related, natural instincts would kick in and he would actually try to mate with one of the females and she would probably let him in that kind of scenario. And that's where the Birmingham boys would come in. That's why it's their job and that's why takeovers in their own way can actually be positive things in terms of enhancing lion genetics. Obviously, they're not bound by any codes of morality. It is just natural instinct to reproduce, and that goes for both the females and the males. So what I'm going to do now, Brent saw these tracks coming down Gowrie Cutline this morning. It hasn't been the hottest day today, and there is a good chance that if there is a male wandering around, that he might need a drink. We don't know, judging from those tracks, we don't know if it's a Birmingham boy or if it's an unknown male. But there's a chance if he wandered through and if he decided to stay, he might need to come for a drink. So I'm going to go and have a look at Galago Pan and just see if there's any sign of tracks coming down there. Uh, something that I've considered as well, which is the question that Donna asked, is maybe one of the females, or that one female that's so skittish, maybe she could be pregnant. And that might be the reason for the skittish behavior. Donna, I thought about it, and I'd, she might be early stage pregnant, but she's not showing any signs of sort of late pregnancies. Her, lipples, her nipples aren't swollen that I could see at all, and it's usually very clear in late stage pregnancy in lions. Their nipples become engorged and much darker in color and they're very clear to see. I haven't seen any of those signs. Could she be in the early stages of pregnancy? Yes, absolutely. It would be next to impossible for us to be able to tell. 
maybe somewhere, I mean, there's another theory, and that's maybe somewhere along the line, I drove through male lion scat. I don't think so. I'm fairly certain I would have noticed. Maybe I drove through a bush that a male lion had urinated on and scent marked his territory, and it caused them to jump up like that because they smelt it. The fact that we've seen that pattern of behavior repeated, though, suggests to me not. I just want to call Craig on the radio, guys. Bear with me one second. Craig, just to let you know, I have pulled out of that Nkuhuma sighting, um, but you will see when my tracks go off-road. Copy, there you go to the west of Impala. That's affirmative. Probably about, I'd say, 150 metres north of the power lines junction. All right. Thanks very much, Jamie. I'll just to let you know, I have told Craig that they are incredibly uncomfortable, so he knows to approach with absolute caution. Oxpecker attempting to enter into the buffalo's ear. As we look at what appears to be half of the Dugaboy population in Juma that has made its way to the pan, <laughs> thereby blowing my theory that there's a possibility of a male lion here, I very often would chase them away. Miss Lobobo Bob, I believe is your name. My apologies if I have not got them entirely accurately. You're wondering that if the Nkuhumas perhaps had crossed over the Sabi Sands boundaries, which of course is always possible for them to do, perhaps entering one of the neighboring reserves, would it be possible that vehicles have not respected their space? And that might be a plausible explanation for their uncomfortable behavior earlier. It is possible they might have at some point made their way into one of the neighboring areas, perhaps somewhere where they just encountered vehicles who didn't necessarily know the ways in which we behave around lions. I, I'm not sure. Honestly, I really, I don't know. I don't think as far as I know that the Nkumas have strayed that far, but they did disappear for quite an extended period of time. It might also just be that they moved into the eastern area of Kruger. Oh, sorry, the western area of Kruger, which borders on Torchwood and Buffelshook. And if they went into that particular part of Kruger, there's absolutely no roads. It's a vast open area that is completely inaccessible to the public. But we are getting some fascinating dynamics here because, can we just go forward a little bit? I feel like there's a, I can't tell if it's a female or a sub-adult buffalo, or both, that's sitting over here. Which is also, I mean, that does, that to me is not the normal male that you would usually see in a dagger boy herd. And the patches around the head, no, it is a young male, doesn't have quite the amount of fur that a female usually has around the, the boss or the base of the horns. But still interesting to observe. Now, a sub-adult of that age, should be, and you can see the difference. I mean, you can see it's much younger, it's browner, the horns are not nearly adult sized. A buffalo like that should be in the herd. It should be in one of the breeding herds. Well, my suggestion would be either it got separated during a lion chase, sometime possibly with the Inkahumas, and stuck around because that herding instinct is so strong, found a group of Dugger boys or these old male bulls and decided to stay with them. Or some strange things are happening with buffalo dynamics in the drought. It's not unrecorded to find some adults with a group of bulls, but it is very, very unusual. And it's certainly a first for me, unless that buffalo with its horns tucked under its body is a female that got separated. I don't think it is though. It looks like a male to me. Hard to tell with this sort of angle. But how interesting is that? When was the last time you saw a herd of Dugger boys with one sub-adult? Oh, and I think we've even got a yellow bulldog ox picker talking about unusual things, unless I'm, maybe I'm mistaken. Let me just double check that. My binoculars. 
Yep. Sitting on the back of the sub-adult, there is a yellow-billed ox picker. Here we go. We've actually been incredibly fortunate with our yellow-billed ox picker sighting. Now that's, many of you, the regular viewers are familiar with this, but for new viewers, there's two species of these birds that sit on buffalo and the other animals. One is a red-billed ox picker and one is a yellow-billed ox picker. It's actually quite unusual to see yellow-billed ox pickers. They are much more rare. You see, that's definitely a male. They're fascinating. But yes, sorry, that yellow-billed bird that you saw there is much less common than its red-billed counterpart. We've been very fortunate in that this yellow-billed ox pick has decided to stick around the Juma Dam and the Galago Pan. Look at that, you can really see the difference in ages here. Very difficult to tell at that age whether or not it's a male or a female to me. Still got tufts of hair around the base of its horn. Interesting. Well, whatever it is, it looks quite content, despite the oddity of finding a buffalo like this in a situation like this. As I said, it's not unheard of. It's just fairly, uh, it's a first for me at least. James is suggesting that it's maybe not that unexpected and that these Duggar boys are not far past their prime. Always a possibility. It's certainly a first for me either way, uh, at least while I've been at Juma, to see this kind of dynamic. What could also be is that there might well be a breeding herd just around the corner, of course. I haven't heard them, and they're usually quite noisy creatures. But there you go, just a fascinating difference. It just goes to show that animals don't have set patterns, and they move as and when they will. Okay. Well, I think it's time for us to continue on for our search for this see if we can find this male lion, if it's still in the area. There's always, of course, the possibility that it was a Birmingham boy wandering through that went straight back towards Torchwood. But I'm curious. I want to just see. I, I had noticed the pattern of behavior with the Nkumas before, but I've never experienced it like we did this afternoon. I wonder if there's not a breeding herd of buffalo somewhere just around the corner. And while I have a look around the corner, let's head over to James's vehicle, get an update from his size and side, and maybe he has more of an explanation as to our mystery buffalo. Hello, everybody. We've now come past Bibblesook Dam, where there was nothing but the dry, dusty tumbleweed blowing across the clay base thereof. No animals there. We're just driving sort of parallel with the drainage, with the major drainage line, the Umnugulbuwati, as we go down, and we're heading towards Twin Dams at the moment. We had tracks of a lioness for a little while, which was quite interesting. I don't know where they've gone, um, but they looked like they were probably from last night. And I wonder if that wasn't the fourth lioness that's joined up with the Umnugulbuwati, and you know, because there were only three when the last when we last saw them. So maybe it was her, but they're definitely not worth following, I don't think. This is wonderful. A lovely question from Gilly in Milwaukee. Um, he wanted to know about Andrew's choice of snack and whether it's safe or unsafe for him to be carrying a melting peanut bar, peanut butter bar, when there are elephants around. I'm, I assume you're asking that tongue-in-cheek. But that said, Gilly, 
Uh, no, look, I don't think, I think an elephant would pick up the smell. I don't think it would entice him sufficiently to make him come over to the vehicle and actually try and take it from Andrew. And if he did, he would obviously come off second best because Andrew is extremely defensive. Oh, there we go, over his peanut bar. Um, and also, apparently, you want to know if we eat peanut butter in South Africa. Yes, we eat peanut butter in great volumes. Uh, we don't have peanut butter and jelly like you do, uh, but we certainly have peanut butter. We sometimes put syrup with it and honey. Peanut butter and honey is an excellent uh, sort of snack, especially with some, some tea if you happen to be hungry in the afternoon. Oh, stop the flying bird. And you're cooking. There's this little fly catcher. Gilly, I'll get back to you. Just a little flycatcher there. I'm going to retrieve my powerful binoculars to try and ascertain the species of flycatcher that it is. It looks like what used to be called a fan-tailed flycatcher or ashy grey. No, it's not. It's just a spotted. It's a standard issue spotted flycatcher. You might just be able to see the streaking on the top of the head. We don't have the super zoom at the moment, but that is the spotted flycatcher. Very nice. And what do you think it eats? Insects. Very good. Funny that, given that its name is flycatcher, don't you think? He's actually a really nice example of a flycatcher. He's got very nicely streaked top of his head. Get the book up and show you what I mean, because I don't think you can quite see it from there. So, Gilly, apparently the Brits on the chat group don't like peanut butter. Well, they just don't know what they're missing out on, do they? I've, we've never, I'm, I, I think when you talk about peanut butter and jelly, I'm assuming that you mean sort of like a jam, possibly without the bits of fruit in it. Um, and I would like to try, Scott, of course, has recently made some marula jam. There is a raptor, that's not the flycatcher. And marula jam and peanut butter, I think, would be a wonderful combination. Well, what is that, Andrew? Very dark. No, it's not. Its tail's much too wide. I'm afraid I'm calling you on that. See how dark it was. The dark north wilburys. With a fat tail. I don't know what else it could have been, except it had a very wide tail. Anyway, uh, maybe a very dark morph tawny. Mm, that's a bit of a horrible guess. There's the flycatcher again, but let me just quickly show you a picture. Oh, Andrew, you can... <laughs> Thank you, Jen B. You say I should try peanut butter and banana or peanut butter and lettuce. I may go with the former. There's absolutely no ways on earth I'm ever going to be eating peanut butter and lettuce. That is not going to happen. But thank you, Jen B. I'm not sure where peanut butter and lettuce uh, are a tradition. All right, here we go. Here's the... Yeah, don't get my fancy new sunglasses. That make me look like a fly. Okay, there is the spotted flycatcher. And you can see that very obvious streaking on the top of the head there. And normally they're solitary. Sometimes they're in pairs. And what are you laughing at? There's a fly crawling in the roof under you. It's an amusing fly. Look at him there. Oh, I see. Right. Cameraman don't know when to, you know, stay in the background sometimes. Okay. And it is a, it's a migrant bird. I'm not sure where it goes. I think it goes up into sort of equatorial Africa. But quite almost indistinguishable from these other birds. Beautiful flycatcher, that one was. Right, so that was the spotted fly catcher. And the one really interesting thing about a lot of these insect-eating birds that catch insects on the wing is that they've got whiskers, and their whiskers just help them when they're flying through the air trying to catch birds, at least catch in insects. It, those whiskers help to sort of, they almost act like a net and help the bird to catch the insect and feed it into their mouths or beaks. Right, on we go.
I know Cindy in North Carolina. Uh, sorry, condolences for the Panthers' loss last night. Sorry about that. Uh, the Denver Broncos, of course, won the 50th Super Bowl. Um, Cindy, you want to know about the tracks there. If we get poison ivy here or poison oak, both of which cause horrible skin irritations, um, we don't actually. We're actually very lucky in that way. The only thing that causes a bit of sting, uh, sort of stinging in the skin, is a stinging nettle that we get out here sometimes. That stinging lasts for about 20 minutes. It can raise a wilt or two, but it really isn't that severe at all. So those are the main things that will cause us trouble here. But no, nothing like your poison ivy or poison oaks. We don't get oak trees here naturally, but we have got lots of oak trees in our urban areas, which were brought in from Britain and from Europe, other parts of Europe, many, many years ago. I love oak trees. I think this is one. And it's a You can see it. Low-hanging dead branch here. Well done. It is a tree squirrel, everyone. Size-wise, much smaller than the European grey squirrel. I'm not sure about the New World squirrels or North American varieties of squirrels, but he's very little. He's only about, mm, how long would you say? He's about 20 centimeters long, which is roughly eight inches. He, of course, is a really brilliant example of an extreme concentrate feeder. So we spoke about the Stienbock, compared that with the buffalo, and what they, the difference in the diet that they have to eat. Something that size could not possibly only be a herbivore in this environment. It would have to eat a lot of seeds and a lot of insects. The insects, of course, and seeds contain fats, which are excellent if you're trying to maintain a very high metabolism. Simply isn't enough energy in the vegetation out here for something that size to eat only vegetation. So you'll find all of the small things will eat lots of seeds. If they're not, predator, if they're not carnivorous, they will eat lots of seeds, insects, and anything with fat in it. They might eat the odd tuber and the odd bit of fruit but it's normally the fatty stuff that they try and find. <laughs> Kristen, Christine Daly, you're asking, you're a new viewer on YouTube and you want to know if anybody knows where in Africa we are. Christine, you'll be pleased to know that I know exactly where we are in Africa and I'm going to show you, I'll draw you a little map if you like. Um, I'm an extremely competent artist, aren't I, Andrew? Aren't I, Andrew? Andrew, I will draw you a little map of Africa, Christine, to show you how competent I am. Don't worry about Andrew, he's just being rude at the moment. Um, where shall we do it? Is, can you zoom in on that? Is that too far or will that be right? Well, that'll be good. All right. Take the stylus with me. Now, Dean, and anybody else who's wondering, this is going to be a very quick geography lesson, and um, I'm not actually a good artist. That's why Andrew was deathly silent. But I'll do my best. Firstly, I shall draw the continent of Africa. You see, Andrew? Uh, that's right. Okay, so that's Africa, everybody. And here is South Africa. That part there is South Africa where we live, and we are on the northeastern side of South Africa here. That's the Kruger National Park. We're in the Kruger National Park, and a little piece of it here. 
which is the Saudi Sands Game Reserve, and that's where you find us. For Africa, this is a terrible picture, and it's obviously totally not to scale. But Africa is a massive, massive continent into which you would easily fit the continental United States, including Canada and possibly Europe as well. So it really is very vast indeed. And we're in the southern tip, or this most southerly country, called South Africa. And... Bless you. Um, and... <laughs> so the most southerly tip of Africa, and in the northeastern corner of South Africa, in the world-famous Kruger National Park. My pleasure to tell you that, Christine, and the most the reason I, I emphasize so much the size of Africa and how far things are from each other on the continent is because our um, tourism took a real knock as a result of the Ebola scare that occurred in the sort of tropical regions of West Africa last year. Now, in actual fact, there was more Ebola in the United States than there was in South Africa because of that one person that came to Texas. We are more than 3,000 miles from where that epidemic took place. We are nowhere near it, and yet people were terrified of coming here because they tend to think of Africa as being one country, and it is such a vast, vast place. failing to find anything in the way of big game. Um, this was made by big game. You can see this is a rubbing post and some kind of animal, probably a buffalo, has come along here and rubbed the mud off. Now what you can sometimes see in this mud is some of the ectoparasites or ticks that the animals have scraped off in the mud. This one, of course, going with my luck of the last two days, is just mud. I think that's enough of that, Andrew. Let's carry on. Hello, Eric in Virginia Beach. Uh, we were talking about poison ivy and poison oak and the, whether we get those sorts of things here. We do not. And Eric, you want to know if we get ticks here that might irritate human beings and give them disease. We do get them here. They do irritate us. They bite us. And they can, if you go into a new area and get bit by the ticks, you can often get something called tick bite fever. Now, tick bite fever is nothing like as nasty as Lyme disease, for example. It's not very pleasant, but it can be treated with doxycyclines. I think it's or tetracycline, one of those sorts of antibiotics, and it's not particularly serious. You take a few days off work, lie on your back, and your right as rain after sort of five days or so. But it's nothing like as nasty as Lyme's disease. But otherwise, um, those are the major things that ticks do carry here. It's really not, it's not a major train smash. And I remember I went to Russia last year, and I didn't even think about trying to get any sort of inoculations for tick-borne diseases or anything like that. And apparently, all the way across Russia and Austria, and, and well, I mean, I guess it must be most of Western and Eastern Europe, you get these encephalitis carrying ticks. And if they bite you, you can get into real trouble. So we don't have anything nearly as nasty as that. Right, James Bear, wonderful. That was a new bird for your list of now 224 birds that you've got on since you've been joining us on Drive. That's an astonishingly impressive list. Good. I'm glad I could add to that. As Andrew was saying, we were driving along the Cheetah Cut Line, the China Cut Line, as I managed to call it earlier. There really is a feeling of kind of not desolation, but certainly of a sort of harshness about the landscape in the midst of the drought. And one of the examples of that is this big tree to my right-hand side, if I can get in the gap, that huge 
a Scotia tree there, Andrew. That Scotia tree, or weeping boer bean, which normally makes beautiful red flowers in the summertime, has got almost no leaves on it at all. It has shed its leaves off. It's normally a, a it would normally be so thick you couldn't see into the tree beyond the canopy. But because there's no water, I think the tree is probably shedding its leaves. And so it looks like a winter landscape almost. So that is quite interesting. All right, we're on Twin Dams Road. Not much in the way of tracks or that sort of thing. Let's head across to Jamie and see what she's got to tell you. I'm going to head towards a treehouse dam and see what might be there. And then we might pop across to Arethusa and see if anything's going on there. So until then, see you just now. Luckily, we have an explanation for our lion's behavior. It was confusing me. I've been racking my brains trying to work out what changed between this morning when there was, yes, one skittish female, but not all of them, and they were still comfortable with a certain distance, and then to this afternoon where all of a sudden something had clearly happened. Craig's just called me now. There's a helicopter flying grids above the area, which is a necessary part of a management strategy. It could be for multiple reasons, and I'm not going to try and guess at what they are. It is one of those necessary things, and it's not doing the animals in any kind of lasting damage. It might just make them uncomfortable. In my experience with all animals in helicopters, they don't like it. A buzzing noise, a very loud helicopter, flying at speed over them and probably repeatedly has what sent them into a very skittish mood. Craig's just radioed me to say that they have relaxed completely. He's got them all lying down again. And we just have a nice explanation for something that was really confusing me. So there we go. I feel a lot better. I was racking my brains. I was most perturbed in my own way about what it was that had upset them like that. And while we, I'm still looking out for this male lion's tracks because you never know, there might be an unknown male that's wandered through and I'd like to just keep an eye out for him. While we do that, Darlene has a question on tracking. Darlene would like to know, because she finds the whole process of tracking fascinating and was wondering, what else can a track show you? Can you tell, for example, the sex or the age of the that everybody Jamie will replace the batteries in her microphone and then she will be back with you she's got a lapel mic on at the moment that's why her sweet and dulcet voice is floating so gently and perfectly to your ears from Rusty's cockpit apparently those lions have relaxed and so Jamie will probably go across them and this is Ebra closer to it, of course, at this stage, because it's across a very wide drainage line. There we go. And now, Reverend Hogwash. Um... <laughs> We do have some great names. Reverend Hogwash, 
you are dangerously close to falling into the doubting Thomas category. You think that perhaps if we are live, we must have very good cell signal out here. Reverend Hogwash, um, we... <laughs> <laughs> Reverend Hogwash, we don't have, we don't have any cell signal out here. It's satellite based. So what happens is Andrew films that zebra. It goes from his camera into an aerial on the back of the vehicle, which goes to a repeater tower on the one of three repeater towers on the reserve. That then goes into the final control and out again via a satellite link to London, I think, isn't it? And from London, it gets distributed to the rest of the world. So it's not got nothing to do with cell cellular signal. It's a, it's a satellite uplink. Thank you, Reverend Hogwash, for that. Um, I hope you are not doubting anymore because one doesn't want to be in the category of Thomas. Right, let us continue towards Treehouse Dam. It's quite a nice little sighting. Beautifully juxtaposed with those colours against the sort of gold and green of my vegetation. And Christine, you're wondering if those zebra are nasty animals. You've heard that they are quite nasty. Yes, they are. They're actually very nasty. I've watched footage of them killing wildebeest calves. I've seen zebra stallions here killing a foal of their own. Um, well, I don't know if it was their own, but certainly the same species. And apparently, if you talk to zookeepers around the world, they will tell you that more injuries of, to zoo personnel are inflicted by zebra than any other animal. That includes tigers and lions and all the other kinds of supposedly vicious animals that sometimes stay in zoos. Okay, let's head across to Jamie. She's fixed her batteries and, well, not her batteries, her microphone batteries. Post and whatever we find. See you tonight. Sorry about that, everyone. We had a slight sound issue, but we're back up and running and sorted. And I was in the middle of addressing Darlene's question about tracks as we continue back towards the lion sighting that we left earlier. Darlene was wondering what tracks can show you apart from just the species of the animal. So you can determine sex for the most part with, for example, something like a lion or a leopard or a cheetah. And that's purely size based. And usually you are able to do it with something like an elephant as well, but then only when you're looking at a sort of an adult comparison. So if you've got a sub-adult male versus a female, you are going to struggle a little bit up until the point where that track diff size difference becomes much clearer. Uh, I was talking about the speed that the tracks can show you and I've spoken about it before. You can see if they're running, you can also see if they're walking fast or rapidly, which is fascinating to look at. So most animals register their tracks, so the back track falls where the front foot was. And so they overlap and it's one of those adaptations for walking silently. And then the further the back track starts to overlap in front of the front track, the faster the animal is walking. And that applies to anything from the cats to elephants to some certain species of antelope. You'll be able to see not just that, but you can judge the age of the track. And that's why I've spoken before about why it's so important not just to know the import, what you might consider to be the high profile animals. So you might know a lion track or a, a um, an elephant track, for example, but being able to judge what other animal species have walked across that track. So, for example, your bird species, your nocturnal mice, frogs, anything like that, and knowing a little bit about their behavior will allow you to determine how old that track is. So it's not on a nice still day in soft sand. Certain tracks can be pretty deceptive. Their outlines stay beautifully clear. But if you come out first thing in the morning, and you've got a track with, for example, a civet track through it, then you know that there's a chance that that track actually came from sometime in the previous afternoon or early in the evening. The civets are nocturnal creatures that move about on set pathways and during the night. So that's one of the things that the tracks can tell you. It is essentially like reading a bush newspaper. 
And it's not just the footprint of the animal, it's all of the signs that they leave, from the mud rubbings that they push on trees to where they've brushed past plants. And very often in my old job where I used to track rhino regularly, we used to be able to follow them by looking at if in places there were place, um, areas where the tracks disappeared. You could actually follow them by looking at where the mud had rubbed off underneath, for example, something like a raisin bush where they had brushed past. And there are people out there, and generally local people, or for example, the bushmen, who are capable of tracking in the most extraordinary manner. You almost feel as though they are so in tune with what they're seeing that it's like some kind of sixth sense about what it is, but really they are just so practiced at reading the signs of the bush. Something like a limp is usually very clear in the track. You'll see a slight change in the distance between the tracks on the left versus the right. Sometimes you see drag marks where the animal's dragging its foot ever so slightly or just a slight flick. And if you are really fortunate, you can even identify the individual animals if you really get to know them. For example, I knew of one individual rhino that I could always, I always knew his track because he had a certain part missing from the, the track of his toes. Some of them get chips. Important not to rely completely on those because something like that could come and go, it could wear away, it could become more or less obvious. You can tell when the animal is turned and you quite often see it, for example, with giraffe or elephant tracks and not, not turned its whole body, that's easy. I'm talking about turning its head. I went once on a tracking lesson with a gentleman who showed me some interesting techniques and one of the things he showed me was where an elephant had stopped and listened to something in the bush or just turned its head to look, either listened or looked off to the left. And he showed me just how the track had smudged, not turned, just smudged ever so slightly off to the side. There's all kinds of things that the bush actually stores up and it tells you essentially the story of what happened there if you have the skills to read it. It's one of the reasons and I think it's one of the, one of the things that has taught me the most about animal behavior. When you start entering into that mindset, first of all of not just looking at the track but looking at the whole picture around you, but then also watching the animal through different eyes. So when you see the animal and you watch the way that they move, what they do, and then going and looking at the tracks afterwards, it builds up an entire picture in your head. And whenever I see tracks walking down the road, and whenever we show them, I would encourage you to do the same, whenever we show them to you afterwards, just picture that animal walking in the way that it did. And you can always, we've seen, had so many scenes where, for example, we've watched cats disappear off down the road in front of us. The next time you see the tracks that we show you walking off, just imagine where those feet fall. And watch the way lions walk. Watch the way they put the side of their foot down first and roll their foot downwards. Instead of just stepping and making a noise, that gentle process, even if it happens with each step, it's a gentle rolling motion. And it's quieter, fascinating. One of the aspects of life out here that I find incredible. It's such a subtle thing, but it makes an enormous difference in the way that you view the world, especially the incredible world that we're out here experiencing. Snake tracks. Snake tracks you can determine quite possibly which species of snake you're looking at. Puff adders, for example, don't move in the usual unless they're moving very fast. They very often leave a completely straight track. They don't do that serpentine motion. They accordion forward almost in a rectilinear motion. And not only that, you can tell the sex of a puff adder by its track by looking at whether or not the tail imprint is there and how long it is because males have slightly shorter tails than females. One of those funny little asides that I really, really enjoy now, in a strange sense of, sense of deja vu, I'm back where I started this morning's drive. This happened twice. There is something around this termite mound. There is some kind of population explosion that has attracted starlings like this Cape Glossy starling, as well as whatever goshawk is calling or lizard buzzard is calling. 
and the drongos. There's all kinds of birds around. There's white brown squab. Oh! <laughs> Sudden panic as a raptor zooms out of the marula tree. And that could well be that step buzzard that I saw earlier. I just want to sit here for a moment. Brian and his incredible skill with following birds. I want to try and figure out what has brought this variety of bird life to this termite mound. I don't see any flying ants or reproductive termites. And yet this place is packed full of the various bird species. The drongos, of course, as always, as the opportunists that they are, first in line. And I can just hear bird calls all around me. What is it that they have found so interesting? It's got to be flying ant reproductives. Let me try reposition so that we can get a different view of the termite mound. And let's see if we can figure out what's going on here. Because I was curious this morning, but we were hot on the tail or the tracks of those lions. And I didn't really get a chance to investigate, but I've seen birds of prey. I've seen all of the different species of birds. Let's just have a look and see if that starling, what it goes for while it's here. And while we do that, Steph was wondering if I could explain, explain a little bit more about that incredible iridescence of the bird. And I've spoken before a little bit about it. Steph finds it fascinating. Oops. So do I, Steph. No, there's nothing. There must be something. There must be reproductive termites or something coming through here. Sorry, Steph, I'll be with you in one second. Interesting. White browed scrud robins all clustered around this area. They must be after termites. It's the only possibility I can <laughs> making poor old Brian duck and dive here because the birds aren't sitting still for one second. There's even a European roller that's just come in. I'll shift forward so you can see it. I can hear parrots. This appears to be the place to be. And yet, usually when you see termite explosions, you can actively see them. Fascinating. At some point, I might hop out of the vehicle and go and have a look. Nope, disappeared. So, Steph, you were wondering about iridescence. And there's another example, although I don't think it's going to stay still long enough for us to show you. You find it on a lot of the bird species, even the kingfishers, surprisingly. And I do want to hop out and investigate, but I'll do that in a moment. I don't really want to actually disturb the birds. They seem to be having such an amazing time. I think we've even got a looks like one of the plum-colored starlings sitting at the top of the tree over there. Oh, no. Can you see where I'm looking, Brian? There we go. Thank you. Perfect. It is. It's a female plum-colored starling. Got a full selection of a bird feeding party here. All fluttering around. Some of the little sunbirds have even made an appearance. And bird calls happening all around us. Now, the plum-colored starling is another example of iridescence in a slightly different way to the one that Steph was referring to. But let's talk about the glossy starlings, even though most of them have managed to avoid our camera for the moment. Cape glossy starlings, virtual starlings, technically only contain one pigment, and that is a black pigment. And then what they have in the sort of layers around their feathers is clear layers of keratin. And the way that it's layered, and the way you know how light, if you pass it through a prism, some kind of prism of glass, you know the way that it refracts and breaks into the different sort of 
rainbow colors that you see, so the different wavelengths of light travel through it at different speeds. And the same applies with the starling and with the keratin. And the way that it's layered reflects back to our eyes only the rays of light that are blue and green in color and gives it that incredible shine. It's like rainbow reflections whenever you have light passing on a mirror in places where it bends ever so slightly. And that's the way that the keratin works on the layers of the starling's feathers, just refracting it back. Now, in terms of that bird feeding party, the only thing that I can suggest that it is, is some kind of insect population explosion. It could be that... The only thing that I can suggest is that that is what it is. It could also be... I'm not sure. I don't think it's a, any kind of butterfly or moth um, population coming out. I've tried to have a look. I haven't seen anything. Usually you see it quite clearly. And I'm sure many of our regular viewers have viewed that before. But back to the starling question. It's just wonderful to have Steph's questions coming through. Steph and I used to work together a while ago now. As time is passing very rapidly. And I believe that Steph might even be coming back to visit at some point, which is an exciting prospect for all of us. And you'll notice that my head appears to be on a swivel at the moment. It's just because I'm fascinated by all of the birds that have been attracted to this area. It's exactly where I found them all this morning. However, I want to get to those lions before they start to move off. And there's nobody else with them, so I don't want to delay for too long. I've heard that name. I don't know if you've sent through questions before, maybe to the other presenters. You were wondering how you get a job like this. And the answer is I feel incredibly fortunate to be in the position that I'm in. But it is entirely possible to achieve a career working as a guide in these wonderful magical areas. But it's not, of course, the only way that you can experience them. Our wonderfully gifted cameraman, for example, also get to come out on drive with us and view the incredible sights that we've that we show you and bring you those incredible images in terms of becoming a guide and actually being in control of a safari vehicle there's a lot of different ways there's a lot of different training facilities but you will have to go through some sort of training before you endeavor to become an active safari guide you have to be most places you have to be over 21 because that is the age at which you can get the special driver's license in order to do it. But that doesn't mean that you can't start your training and then commence with your career in a more gradual way. There's lots and lots of training facilities throughout South Africa, and I would encourage you, if you're really keen on it, to have a look into the various ones. One good place to start is to have a look at the FGASA website, F-G-A-S-A. They will be able to point you in the right direction. And there's lots and lots. And if you are really serious about becoming a guide, then you're also more than welcome to contact us through the final control. And they will send your details on to one of the presenters or all of the presenters. And we'll be able to pass on some advice that might be a bit more individually um, tailored for the, your sort of approach and what sort of thing, what kind of job you're looking for. I personally trained for six months and the duration of your training can vary. I trained for six months and then spent six months doing an unpaid internship before being fully qualified and working as a guide. But there are different approaches for different people. And of course the thing is you can train to be a safari guide but your training and your learning never stops and your ability to take your qualifications further also never ceases. So there's a sort of a basic level and the point at which you can become a guide. There are government exams that you have to write. It is monitored by the government. You have to do their assessments. You have to fulfill those roles. And once you get that, then you can take it further, further, step by step as you go, as you move along. You were 
wondering, because I mentioned goshawk earlier, you were wondering what species I saw. James, sorry, I made a mistake and I corrected it straight afterwards, but I think I was mumbling my words. I heard it, I didn't see it, um, and it was a lizard buzzard that I heard that I called a goshawk and then corrected myself. I also saw a step buzzard, which has been fairly unusual, but unfortunately it was a very fleet, fleeting sighting as it flew across the to over the top of us. But that was a, <coughs> excuse me, that was a step buzzard. It's been hanging around the area recently. I think Brent said he's seen about three. I've only seen two, and that was in the last three or four days that I've noticed them. Step buzzards, like step eagles, are migratory species. I've also seen this afternoon, I saw a harrier hawk chasing a step, the step buzzard that we saw earlier, but I have, it was unfortunately not while we were live and it was over very, very quickly. We weren't able to get it on camera for you. But the bird life today has been incredible. I'm still going to return to that termite mound and figure out exactly what those birds are after. I just don't want those lines to disappear on us before we've had a chance to view them nice and relaxed again. And while I make my way back towards the lions, James has made his way onto Arethusa. So let's find out what's happening there. My sunglasses, I keep forgetting to take them off because it's rude for me to look at you with them on. I'm going to, uh, I'm just going to show you. You see, I can't, I can't see into your eyes when I do that. It's very rude of me. Sorry about that. Um, now, we're on the Arethusa airstrip, the international airport. And over there, of course, is an aeroplane, which is what you would expect to find. That is called a Cessna Caravan. It's a turboprop 12-seater. And interestingly, actually, there is actually something quite interesting about it. That is, a, that is extra fuel. It takes Jet A1 fuel to go in that aeroplane there. Uh, we can't put that in the Land Rover. It will explode. On the wheels there, you will notice a number of thorns, red, uh, red thorn branches, Acacia gerardii, excellent for deterring hyenas that might like to come along and chew on the tires. Anyway, that little aeroplane is a brilliant bush aeroplane. It can take off on very little uh, space, stay up for a long time, doesn't need to be pressurized, can carry a big load. This airstrip is way long, way too long for an, an aeroplane like that. It can take, this airstrip can probably take something the size, you know what, I think we're just going to drive down there to that waterhole there. It can probably take an aeroplane the size of a citation or private private jet, so those of you who, you know, have got a private jet parked outside your houses, feel free to fly it to Arethusa, you can land it here. Geraldine would like to know who are the brave souls who collect the branches to put around the, uh, the wheels of the aeroplane there. I'm Jerry, I'm assuming they're the land management team for Arethusa. It's not the most brave task I've ever seen anyone um, have to do. I don't think you can compare it, for example, with going over the top, circa 1916 for some. There's a large raptor. Now that raptor, I'm going to ask you to try and identify everybody. See if you can identify it. I know it's not a great picture, but that's all you need to see of that bird to be able to identify him. And I'm going to give you a few clues. One is that it's an eagle, and two, obviously, it's a brown eagle. And I'm going to tell you which brown eagles we get here, and you're going to tell me which one of those that one is. We get, in no particular order, the Wahlberg's eagle, the tawny eagle, the booted eagle, the lesser spotted eagle, and the step eagle. That one can be only one of those. I'm, there's not a shadow of doubt in my mind as to which one that is. So see if you can tell me which one you think it is, and I will tell you why I'm so certain which one it is. So have a good look there, and then while you're sending in your answers, 
I'll continue to drive down the Arethusa International Airstrip. Yeah, I'm convinced. I'll get Andrew to give you an answer too if you want a clue. But not yet, Andrew. Say I knew the answer, where would I send it to? Well, you would tell me. Oh. Yeah, you wouldn't need to uh, hashtag it. Yeah. Hashtag Safari Live? You could. But does your phone work here? No. Okay. Well, you could just tell me, I'll tell Jerry. another one. See? Is it taking off? That is a different species. That's a Wahlberg's eagle, that one. Look at this. See how thin the tail is? And if you can see there, there you get just an idea of how skinny the tail is in comparison with that other very dark bird that we saw flying over earlier. All right, let's drive along. You tell me which of those brown eagles you think that is. Very picturesque there with the gray of the trunk, tree trunk, the green underneath, and the sort of cloudy blue sky behind. Country West, Patty and Ginny, you are our resident ornithological geniuses for the day. You say tawny eagle. Orlando, brown snake eagle was not one of the options I gave you. Um, it is not a brown snake eagle, and I mean, that was obvious. I'll tell you why. Simply because it was feathered all the way down its legs, and you could tell that from, from where we were. So the rest of you who got it correct, the reason it's so obvious is that he looks so mottled. He looks untidy, unlike any of the other eagles or raptors that I've seen around here. They all look very pristine and neat as they look around surveying the land for something to eat. The tawny always looks like it's kind of flown through a hedge when it sits down on the tree there. And it's also got sort of darker wings. The back of the wings are much darker than they are than the rest of the bird is. So that's why it's awesome. Well done. I'm most impressed by the three of you. Orlando, the work to do. Anyone on lock with to go over on Tim Pan? So you can see the wind is blowing from the southwest. According to the wind sock. It's quite unusual, sort of southerly. in Texas, you want to know when we go on leave, do we go on that plane? Um, well, that was the original idea. I mean, that's a, it's a commercial plane, but we haven't managed to sort of organize it so that we can get on a commercial flight. It's a very much in its infancy, and so it kind of only flies when it has to, and it's not going to fly for some staff going on, on leave. So I think eventually we probably will catch that plane, but no. We normally either drive to Hoodsprate, so Nikki and Scott drove to Hoodsprate the other day, and then no, well, they actually drove out of there too, but normally we'd drive to Hoodsprate and fly out, otherwise I would drive home back to Johannesburg and then fly down to the Eastern Cape. Here are some impalas. Very nicely backlit there. A lovely little bachelor herd here, and you can see the young bachelors are with their older co cohorts, and they won't be tolerated for too much longer. In about two months' time, the male's testosterone levels in, will start to elevate as the length of the day starts to decrease. And as that happens, they'll start to find each other's company less and less pleasurable, and eventually they will start fighting with each other. Now the little ones won't, 
they'll just kind of get on with life for another year or so, trying not to be eaten. They're, whereupon they will forget entirely about defense and think only of sex, which is what happens between sort of April and June, if you happen to be a male impala. Right. There is word of some elephants here on Arethusa in the drainage line called the Marikani, which is the drainage line we were in yesterday. And so we're going to try and speed up there and see if we can't catch them before they abscond somewhere. Hold on, Andrew. Daniel, very good question. You say you know that I described the area that we were in earlier with the drawing of a very poor map, and you want to know how big this area is and how many miles we cover during a drive or during a day. It's 1,500 hectares, or about 4,000 acres is the total area that we're able to traverse, which in the context of a game reserve is not enormous. It's not too bad, but it's, it's not very big. And we probably drive on average like today, this drive, because we've come from Juma to Arethusa and we'll be going back again, will probably be roughly 20 kilometers, I would imagine. So that's probably about 12 miles. And on a, on a busy day, so Jamie, for example, she's got had all that action quite close to camp. I don't think she'll drive more than seven or eight kilometers, which is about five miles. So it just depends on what we're seeing and where we see it. Zumi, you asked yesterday about the baby dickops or thick knees that there are at the Arethusa Dam. You want to know if we'll go and have a look? Absolutely. We'll go past there. We'll have a look and see if we can see your baby thick knees, and I'll let you know if we find them. In the meantime, let us go across to Jimmy. She's back with those uh, fairly nervous kitties. I think they've relaxed a bit, so that's a good thing, and I'll see you shortly. Well, this is much better. This is far more the norm. A pile of sleeping cats, all lying together in the shade where we left them earlier, and this time perfectly comfortable with us being around. I'm fairly certain now, in hindsight, it was the chopper that unsettled them in that way. And as you can see, we're back to our normal, lovely in Kuhuma pride. I've still given them plenty of space, just to make sure that since they have been stressed already once this afternoon, I decided that I thought it would just be best, even though it compromises our view a little bit, but it would just be best for us to view them from this position. And still stunning to see them and of great comfort to know that they are happy again and that it had absolutely nothing to do with our presence and more to, to do with external factors. And as you can see, not up to terribly much on this fairly warm and muggy afternoon. There's rain across the mountains and it makes me wonder whether or not that's why the tortoises have been popping out and the frogs have been calling. Maybe they smell that or they sense the humidity in the air. Hopefully, fingers crossed it comes this way, but unfortunately I don't think so. Not this time. The clouds have built up all across the west and north of us. But they don't show any inclination to come across in this direction. In fact, it doesn't even look as though it's the beginning of a cold front or the end of a cold front. Just some very strange weather patterns blowing over. 
The lion's taking as much of advantage in the quarry bush shade as possible. The drainage line between Inyala Road and uh, Bassalier Road is zoned no vehicles in it. That's where we've got covered in there are less than we hold at the moment. Oh, Star has made a comment um, through observation that a lot of the animals have seemed to be nervous over the last few days. The hyenas, the elephants, and she was saying that she wishes that we had the same level of sensory perception that they do. It would certainly be helpful for us and of course the first thing I think of is animals' response to things like earthquakes or tidal waves and their ability to predict those kinds of phenomena. As to what's been causing the nervousness of the animals, I think we have our answer for the Inkuhumas. The hyenas, I'm fairly certain it was because the lions had made that kill quite close to their den. We never found out exactly where the kill site was, but we know it was in the same block as the hyena den. And the elephants are drought stressed. And as far as I can tell, I've noticed it with a lot of them because what that has meant is not just that they have to work, walk further and further for access to water and food, but also the fact that that's brought more big males, more big males than I've ever seen in my time at Juma that have come wandering onto the property and we've all remarked upon that fact. Large male elephants that have started to harass and put pressure on the breeding herds. That's another reason why they are a little bit, I don't know if I'd call it nervous or just slightly more in a slightly more emotional state there. I think that's the female. Is that the female with the scar on her back? It is, I think. I can't quite tell in this light. There, it looks, that looks like her. She's the female that was the most stressed earlier. Doesn't look terribly put out now. In fact, she looks perfectly content. But it's something we're going to see more and more of as the drought continues, particularly with things like elephants and buffalo. The weather, they react to the pressures of the weather systems. And it is one of those, I spoke about it this morning and this afternoon, the fact that no matter how well you think you know individual animals or how well you think you know the different species, it's always important to remember that the wild aspect means there is complete unpredictability. <laughs> oh, looking very comfortable there. Still full bellied, but between the four lionesses, they finished off whatever they killed last night. I wonder whether it's not also a possible explanation for our mystery buffalo that infiltrated the buffalo, the Duggar boy herd that we saw earlier. They may well have managed to catch a buffalo at some point. Whatever it was, they're finished with it now. And in the next few hours, it's just a matter of where they're going to decide to go and drink, would be my guess. Bellies up, and just allowing the breeze of the day to cool them down ever so slightly. And don't forget, guys, that although we're sitting with sleeping lions now, as I said, with the wild aspect, you just never know what to expect. There is a herd of impala probably about 70 meters away from where we are now. I'm not sure if they know that the lions are around. They did earlier, but I don't know whether that means they've decided to move off. But even though these lions are lying with full bellies, it doesn't mean that they won't jump up and head out to try and catch something. Cats like this are opportunists, and it doesn't do to pass up any kind of opportunity for your next meal. And if you have any questions or any comments that you would like to make, on any aspect of our lives out here, even if it's to do with how we experience the bushveld experience, or if you would like a bit of a historical update on the lions that we're looking at at the moment, 
feel free to ask us on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. It sounds as though, from what I've been listening to on my Game Drive channel, it sounds as though the Birmingham boys have lived up to their prolific buffalo hunting reputation. He is twitching against the flyers. Seems as though they have killed at least two buffalo, from what I've heard. And talking about the droughts, as we've discussed before, the lions are going to profit immensely at this time and in these weather conditions. And it's one of the reasons why the Inkahumas are looking as good as they are looking. Definitely in the best condition I've seen them in since the Birmingham boy takeover. They've been well fed pretty much every day that I've seen them. Their old wounds have all healed up. And they don't really have to cover vast distances in order to search for prey. The prey essentially has to come to them. As long as they target the water holes and the dams, they're ideally positioned to take advantage of whatever opportunities come their way. The nice thing actually I've noticed is while we've been sitting with the lions is the flies that have been following us around and the Mapani bees. And Mapani bees look like tiny little flies. They're all after moisture. Some of them are blood-sucking flies that come down and bite us. It's nice to know that our entourage of flies has moved off towards the Inkahumas. Not that I wish them upon them, but it has granted Brian and myself some relief from the flies that have been buzzing around. Where will these ladies go next? Where do you think they're going to go next? For those regular viewers familiar with our geography, are they going to pop onto Arethusa? Are they going to go onto Simbombili? Or are they going to turn around and go back towards the Juma Dam and the Juma Pan? I'd love to hear where you think they're going to disappear off to next. In fact, let's take a guess and let's see who gets it right tomorrow. I think they're going to go to One Eyed Pan on Simbambili. Okay, and while we're sitting with the lions, having a big stretch, there goes the leg. And the lion's not up to much. Jared is on 99 bird species, and his OCD feelings have kicked in, and he really wants just one more to bring him up to a nice round number. Jared, hmm, I'm gonna try and see if I can spot one for you. There's always the chance that even though we're with lions, and Jared has very kindly said that he knows that we've got lions, so it doesn't have to be today, but that doesn't mean that we can't find you a new bird species. And now I'm doing a frantic search of the various bushes around us. I think I will have to enlist James's help as well in terms of finding Jared a new bird species and, of course, all of the other viewers. The difficulty, Jared, of, is that we have to try and figure out which ones you have on your list. I'm going to assume you've got all of the typically seen ones like the fork-tailed drongos, the hornbills, the starlings, all of those would have been covered already. We're gonna have to keep our eyes peeled maybe for one of the little cysticulars or the larks, something hiding around here in one of the trees. You never know, a bird feeding party could well come past us, but luckily we've also got James out in the fields to help us look. And we shall task him with finding Jared's hundredth bird species. Not, of course, forgetting about the bird lists of all of the other viewers. And Bethany is concerned about the olfactory safety of both Brian and myself. And what I mean by that, you've, you asked or you've said that you hope that Brian and myself are sitting upwind of these lions. And you actually described it as the flat 
petulant cats. This morning was probably one of the most entertaining mornings that I've spent with flat cats, as we term them, because one of them happened to let loose quite an explosive um, expulsion of flatulence that then wafted over Andrew and myself and sent us into eye-watering, um, an eye-watering state, and trying to cover our face. Andrew had his buff around his face. I was trying to breathe through my sleeve. But the funniest part of that sighting was actually all four lions, including the one responsible for the sound effects, the fireworks of the morning, actually got such an enormous fright that they shot off in all four different directions. <laughs> highly, highly entertaining. <laughs> It is, of course, one of those byproducts, unfortunate byproducts, of um, their most recent meal is that it has resulted in some gastric distress, apparently. Fortunately, that seems to have ceased. However, they've put themselves in a much nicer position, and I'm sure Brian is also fairly grateful. He's nodding in the back. Fairly grateful for our new positioning, which is pretty much upwind, not upwind of them, but at least not perfectly downwind, which is where Andrew and I were situated this morning. And they'd put themselves in such a perfect guari row that we couldn't go anywhere else. That was it. I've mentioned that there's a possibility that these rather full lines, having discussed the end product of their digestion, we thought that maybe there's a possibility that they killed a buffalo. But Country West has said they couldn't surely have eaten a whole buffalo in one night. Country West, I think, honestly, it was two. Um, I think it was from yesterday morning that they had that kill in that block. It just took us a while to find them. And it does sometimes happen, especially in dense vegetation like that. And when they don't, when they move across paths that don't leave clear tracks, and if you can't hear the audio of them fighting over access to the kill, and you do occasionally miss out on the sighting, so I think it was two days. That being said, they could finish a buffalo, and the reason I say that is because the buffalo are currently having calves. So they could well be new. I've seen one or two brand new little wobbly babies. It is the perfect time for them to start dropping their babies. So they could easily finish off a buffalo calf in that time. I could be completely wrong about that, though. May well not have been a buffalo. They, all four of them have got round bellies, but they're not completely stuffed. And it was finished in the space of about, I would say, about 24 hours. It was an interesting morning spent trying to track these ladies. They were doing a dance, or leading us on a dance. I've mentioned that it's entirely possible that if something wanders through, they will take the opportunity to hunt it. But Bethany was wondering if that doesn't occur, so if, a, if an animal doesn't wander through, how long will it be until they decide to hunt again or actively pursue prey? And Bethany, it will be given the sort of the fullness of their stomachs and the speed of their digestive processes, I would say it would probably be about in the next two or three days when they start to really actively look. Though that being said, there's always the chance that they move through an area, spook something, and attempt to hunt, or sorry, spot something, not spook something. They won't generally try and hunt something that they've frightened already. But if they spot something that they want to join, then they might try and have a go. All our lions are flat, and James has been looking for other wondrous animals to show you. And something that might be on their menu at some point in the next few days is a water buck. So let's go and have a look. Wondrous indeed. We have the water buck bull here at Arethusa Dam. And he was accompanied by a whole lot of youngsters and a couple of cows. They have taken fright and run off, and he is busy grazing just trying to get the last bit of nutrition before he has to start watching out for the great creatures of the night that might come to eat him, a.k.a. the Inkahuma Pride. Now, he is not alone here at the Arethusa waterhole. Uh, Andrew will now skillfully display a great migrating herd of wildebeest streaming across the plains there. 
possibly going to come down for a drink. We'll get a little bit closer shortly. And quite a nice herd of wildebeest. And Joe, you can try and count them. I'm going to do the same. One, two, three, four, five, six. I get 22, 23. And then they're in amongst some water buck as well, some female water buck. Right, let's go a little bit closer along the damn wall here. You might also, Andrew, can you see the horn sticking up there? Look, <laughs> there's another water buck having a little bit of a drink just over there. And another one over there. KB Zumi, I'm not sure which deck you saw those dip ops under. I suspect that it's under the far deck over there. And that deck, unfortunately, belongs to the owner or the general manager, so I don't really want to go and drive underneath it in case he's perhaps showering and getting himself ready for dinner. Imagine having a camera as he walked out for his evening constitutional. Jared, you want to see another bird because you have 99 on your bird list and Jamie, of course, is sitting with the lions and therefore unable to do too much in the way of birding. Right, there is a blacksmith lapwing. I don't know if you've got that one, Jared. There should also be an African jacana knocking about here somewhere. Yes, there is one there, Andrew, just over the top of the hippopotami. That is the hippopotamus itself. Just way, just over the top there, right at the edge of the, the greenery. Ah. ah, there we go. And then, Jared, you might be able to hear the bearded woodpecker behind us. Tick, 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 I'm not sure if you're allowing yourself sounds. And then, guinea fowl, helmeted guinea fowl we have here. There they are. A little helmeted guinea fowl. So, Jared, that's three or four species and some jippo geese, of course, but I'm sure you've got them. Look at the wildebeest having a bit of a role there, Andrew. Behold. He's enjoying a good roll. The rest of this herd doesn't seem to be coming down to drink. Well, some of them are. The rest of them are just grazing on the clearing here. And let's try and also count the number of calves and just see if it isn't our Juma herd. There are 10 there. This herd has one. I think this one's only got seven youngsters. So, yeah, seven youngsters. I, this, I don't think this is our herd. I think it's a different one, which is good. It means wildebeest numbers are pretty good. And there's also, of course, just to the left of where Andrew's looking now, sorry, right of where he's looking, there are some buffalo. <laughs> and those buffalo bulls are just having a snooze down in the mud. Now, sometimes you can confuse wildebeest for buffalo. Well, some people can. And if you look at them together like that, they're very clearly completely different animals. One of them is face planting there. That's very interesting to see. He has basically head butting the mud. It's a very strange thing to be doing. It's very amusing. nice roll. That looks to be a yearling. You can see the horns are not quite fully formed yet. A yearling who's just frolicking about, still in the throes and joys of youth. Hello, Heidi in Switzerland. Um, like I think I've said to you before, what a very appropriate name to have, being a Swiss lady. Ooh, 
frolicking around there. Heidi, you want to know about whether when it rains here, does it rain short and sharp or does it rain for a few days? Normally, short and sharp, Heidi, we do get fronts that will come through for up to five days at a time, but normally they only just sort of blow a bit of wind and drop a few spits of rain. But the proper rain comes from short, sharp storms that generally don't last more than an hour at a time. I'm just going to look underneath the general manager's deck from here. I don't wish to see him in his towel or smoking jacket. And see if I can find those dickops or thick knees. I can see some nyala, but I don't see any thick knees at this stage. Okay, Pete, we will keep a lookout for them. They're great. It's so peaceful to come and sit by the water like this and watch animals coming down to drink. I find it just possibly the best thing to do. Very little going on in terms of bird song. Just a dove calling behind us, the old Franklin. And then I can hear one other bird. That's a virtual starling there, Andrew, well done. One other bird I can hear, and so we'll just pop around there and see if we can't see him is the red-billed buffalo weaver. Now, I don't know if you have that one on your list, Jared, but let's go. Ooh, yellow-fronted canaries. That's the yellow-fronted canary, that tail there. Oh, no, that's a grey-headed sparrow. It was in a mixed flock with some yellow-fronted canaries. Almost impossible to film. Go on. Is that a brood brood? No, I think it's another, another sparrow. Oh, yes, it is. Grey-headed sparrow. That swizzling call. <laughs> That's the yellow-fronted canary calling. Sorry, Jerry, could you go again with Larry's question, if you don't mind? Ah, Larry, absolutely, good question. You want to know when squirrels and birds sound the alarm, do other species heed the warning? They do indeed, Larry. Absolutely, they heed the warning. So if m mongoose and squirrels start alarm calling, you'll find any animals around that are potentially prey items will definitely look up. There's a big bird in the dead tree there. That is a Wahlberg's eagle. And I know that because of the little crest that he put up at the back of his head. There you can see it now. Small eagle. And I can just smell the wood smoke coming out of the camp here. This is one of my very favorite bush smells, is the, mm, the smell of a wood fire just before supper time or before story time around the fire. See how close we can sneak to the small bird's eagle, I think it'll probably fly off. Some three banded plovers, Jared. I don't know if you've got them. I'll try and get a picture of them once we've stopped this eagly. Hello, Mr. Eagle. Being particularly friendly to 
success. Silhouetted against the sky there. The sun is now actually pretty spectacular. In fact, before I try and show you the three-banded plover, I'm just going to drive around this bird. Feel free to take some screenshots. I'm going to take a picture with my telephone and uh, hope that it's not too appalling. Yes, I don't feel it quite does the as a justice. I was recently showing, my mother said, could she look at my photographs? So I said, of course you can, mother. And she said, um, she said do you have, e have any that aren't of the sun? And I had to admit that I, I don't think I do have many that aren't of the sun. <laughs> yes. Isn't that lovely? All righty. Oh, I can also hear, Jared, a greater blue-eared glossy starling going... <laughs> There, Andrew, if you go behind the buffalo's bottom, there is a three-banded plover. There are a few of them knocking about there. There you are, two three-banded plovers, Jared, three of them. You can have those for your list. I've now probably got you one or 102 or 101, which will probably make you feel equally awkward. Okay, let's carry on from here. I hadn't intended to spend quite so long here. I wanted to try and get those elephants, which we will still try and do. But the first thing I'm going to try and do is not end up in the drink, parted precariously as we are. Andy, hold on tight. Go to your loins. You ready? Without their mums. And look, they've got their little horns. See already? Just what would they be now? December, January, bit of February. Two and a half months old. They've already got little horns. So precious. It's wonderful to see. They've done really well, both the herds, to have got this many little ones to this age is brilliant. Hmm. But you can see, not a lot for them to eat at all. Question. Jeffrey, you want to know what the best smelling firewood out here is? Well, I don't know that I've ever actually sort of learnt the learnt of a, a better smelling species than others. I think the acacias probably smell the best. They're the least sort of aromatic. So I think it's probably them. You can also uh, burn something called tambuti, 
And Tambuti smells delicious, but it's very toxic and you can't cook on it. And if you inhale the smoke for too long, you start to feel rather sick. But it does smell wonderful. So Tambuti and Acacia. Right, let's head across to the carpet of cats, see what's going on there. And I will try and catch up with you when we have got some elephants to show you. Forward ho, Andrew. And what a glorious evening this has turned out to be. Absolutely stunning. So, Jared, did James manage to find your hundredth bird species for you? Or are you still on the lookout? Will we be able to beat James and find Jared's hundredth bird? And as Brian said earlier, Jared's got a problem. He's got 99 birds, but a finch ain't one. Perhaps we should try and find a finch species to show him. As you can see, there's been tremendous movement from our four lionesses. One of them I think might have rolled over, and I think that one flicked her tail earlier. So all in all, a very active afternoon for the ladies of the Unkahuma Pride. Looking particularly restful. One of them looks like she's cuddling. What is she cuddling there? A buffalo thorn. And there you can see that puncture wound on the top of her head that's healed up. That, almost, that definitely looks like a tooth to me. It's not actually a buffalo thorn, my apologies. It looks like a young knob thorn, now that I can see it closely. Still not the most comfortable tree in the world to cuddle. That injury is healed up nicely, though. That could easily have come from one of the other lionesses or from an encounter with a male. Nothing too serious. It's amazing how resilient these animals actually are. Says, there you go, there's the female with the scar on her back. We've repositioned just to give you a slightly better view. And you can see where that's healed. And that's not going to be there forever. It's not going to be an identifying mark. The fur will grow back and cover that almost completely. At least they don't seem to have the same tick load around their eyes as they did the last time I saw them. There's still some around the base of the ears. Now this morning, one of the females, and I think it was Amber Eyes, was actually nibbling on a buffalo thorn. Oh, big stretch. Hello, girl. Here you are. Stretching out her claws. <laughs> <laughs> Quick belly rub there. <laughs> she didn't appreciate being laughed at. <laughs> and that puff of breath, you could see it blowing all of the leaves around her. But yes, they, are, they do carry ticks and parasites and fleas and mites. The other frustration, of course, are all of those flies that are shooting around their ears and their tails. Now, both the lions and myself and Brian and the other guests that are here in the sighting have all experienced the irritation that can be the biting flies, or the stable flies, I think, are the ones that are causing us most of our uncomfortable, itchy bites. And Pamela, you were wondering if they pass any diseases on to the lions or if they're just an annoying nuisance. And those particular species, as far as I know, don't pass on anything particularly malicious. I wouldn't be surprised if they can cause bacterial irritations 
to the animals concerned and I certainly react more than other people but I think that's more an allergic response than anything else. But there are certain types of insects, for example tsetse flies, although we don't have, aren't plagued by that problem here. But there are certain species of fly that can pass on diseases and parasites. And for the most part you'll find that all of these animals are incredibly parasite ridden, particularly within their intestinal tracts, within their stomachs and their intestines. They'll carry all kinds of tapeworms and parasitic worms. They'll also carry diseases like tuberculosis, which uh, most of the time doesn't affect them in a major way. It lies dormant. They have, an ex to an extent, they have an internal resistance to it, but they do occasionally go through outbreaks of it. It affects, oh, she's dreaming, I think. Her feet twitching. Just like your pet cats and dogs do at home. That wasn't just a reaction to flies, that was an actual, a little bit of a dream run. Station uh, out of the now this morning, our search for the Inkuhuma lioness has started off with following each and every vulture that we could find sitting on the trees around us. And I believe that James has found another vulture to show you. Right, hello everybody. We've just given a quick segment here on this vulture, a white-backed vulture. Uh, one just flew off. This one looks like it's skulking, searching the landscape for carcasses of recently expired animals. And, of course, this is exactly how Jamie was trying to find the lions today. She was looking at a vulture exactly like this, the white-backed vulture. In the background, you can hear a long-billed crombeck alarm calling frantically, going... Pff, 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 pff. Now, normally they would do that to birds of prey, but I don't think that they would alarm at a vulture like this, unless they're slightly myopic. All right, and that's the vulture. Let's head back across to Jamie and the lions. Oh. Still with our flat and dreaming cats. And what do you suppose? the lionesses of the Unkuhuma pride like to dream about during their 20 odd hours of sleep a day. The world's longest cat naps. What is going through their minds? Do they get the same intricate dreams we do? Or is it just basic instinctive flashes of memory? I would love to know. And I'd welcome your suggestions. While we are watching the lionesses, Iggy has suggested that the possibility of some of their strange behaviors might be explained by the lunar phase that we're in at the moment. It is new moon that we are currently experiencing. She's suggested that the various phases of it and the way in which it impacts the animals could have or is known to cause discomfort within the animals themselves. It's an interesting point, Iggy. It's not something I've ever really considered, although I have discussed it with... I have discussed it with various people within the camp and the effect that the moon has on the animals themselves. Now, for the lionesses, new moon is actually probably the best time of the lunar cycle for them, to an extent. Apparently, Iggy says that the lunar causes... Um, unsettled behavior 
the new moon causes unsettled behavior within the animals themselves. But for the lionesses, new moon means no ambient light for the various prey species to utilize in order to spot them. And this is where they have, their studies have shown them to have their highest success rate. Either the new moon or on windy clouded nights where there's nothing much to help the prey species to spot them. And that's the time when they are most adapted in order to be able to hunt and sneak up and stealthily ambush their prey. And it feels as though every time I look at the sky, Speaking of clouds and weather conditions, it seems to look more and more spectacular. Looks incredible this afternoon. You can see the rays of light shooting through. Ah, oh, and I got all excited. I saw a bird flying in. I thought it was going to be a new one for Jared. It turned out to be a starling, so I don't think so. We'll have to work harder than that. But just look at the sky. That is absolutely exquisite. Just taking a moment to enjoy the sounds of the bush and the scenery. Wow. Stunning. Every cloud is a golden lining in Africa. Was that a bit corny? I think that was a little oh, bit corny. Oh, Brian liked it. <laughs> Here we go. And back to our sleeping lines. I just thought I'd allow us a few moments of relative silence, apart from my every cloud has a golden lining. I, I don't know, Brian. I think uh, it might have been a bit of a stretch. OK, thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. <laughs> Back to our sleeping giddy cats. Cindy, you were wondering if lions purr like domestic cats. And Cindy's watching all the way in Florida, and yes, they do. The one difference is the, <laughs> the volume of their purring. It is absolutely incredible to listen to. Now, Cindy, I don't know if you've been around for the mating leopards because you don't hear lions purr as often as you do from a female leopard attempting to seduce a male. But that incredible load almost sounds like growling when a big cat purrs. And the lionesses do purr and they often purr when they move together and they do that head rub, that traditional, I suppose traditional is the wrong word to use, but their standard lion greeting where they rub each other's heads and cheeks against each other, affirming both their social bonds and also taking a very solid opportunity to impart their scent onto another member of the pride. And very often you'll hear them purring when they do that, but it's a much deeper, rougher sound. It can almost sound like growling to the uninitiated. Although when you do hear a lion growl, you won't mistake it for any other kind of sound. And we were witness this morning to some incredible scenes with the females grooming each other, aloe grooming, A-double-L-O, aloe grooming. And we spoke a little bit about the hormonal release that probably happens within their bodies when they do perform those bonding acts. And we had a question through about it and I did go and look up whether or not there's any research done into the release of serotonin or oxytocin, any of those sort of endorphin-like hormones that in humans give us that feel-good, happy feeling. And I suggested that I'm almost certain within lions that it does, that, it, that they do release that whenever they perform those social bonding rituals. I did have a look. I wasn't able to find any research on it, but I'll keep looking because I'm very curious to know if that does occur. 
it makes total sense to me as a way, an evolutionary advantage of keeping the pride together. And a pride for a lion is one of the keys to its success as a species. The cooperative social hunting that they perform. It's all enhanced by the natural bonds that they have together. in Tampa. <laughs> cats in Tampa made me laugh out loud there. Um, cats has said that perhaps the Nkuhuma ladies are dreaming of the Birmingham boys arriving just in time for Valentine's Day. <laughs> I don't know, I found that quite amusing. And Alina has even suggested that they are dreaming of the giant catnip in the sky that they might have access to. Interestingly enough, Alina, they do react to catnip just the same way that domestic cats do. So they get as enticed by the presence of catnip and lose their mind and go a little bit crazy for it. It's not something that naturally occurs here. And the only reason I know that is I know that they did do a study into it. I wouldn't really go throwing catnip about and distracting the lions with that kind of um, interest. But I did have a good chuckle as well about the Birmingham boys arriving for Valentine's Day. You never know, ladies. One of your sisters or aunts or whatever she might be is currently off occupying the attention of the Birmingham boys. But she'll be finished by the time Valentine's Day comes. And for new viewers, a bit of an explanation as to what I'm talking about. The fifth and final female within this pride is currently mating with the Birmingham boys, a coalition of five young males. They're off to the east of us at the moment, but you never know when they might decide to pay us a visit on Juma. They wander through with, well, they wander close to Juma's boundary with a fairly regular patrol pattern. But she will be mating with them. I'm actually surprised that she's still with them or at least that she's still mating with them. It seems like it's been quite an extended estrus period. But for lionesses, it can be anywhere from between five to seven days that they spend mating with the male. And it seems like so long ago that we were watching the Matimba males mate with the Styx females. As we look at these incredible, perfect hunters, we have a question about the males versus the females hunting. And it's a question that comes all the way from York. And Jilly, I've been to York actually. I really, really liked it there. I think it's a beautiful area. But Jilly wanted to know, do I think that the females are better hunter than males? Because you've seen two kills and in both of those, it was the females that affected them. And yet it seems as though the males always get to eat first. And it's a quite a comp, that's actually quite a complex question and it comes with a couple of different answers. First of all, to an extent, lionesses are not necessarily better hunters, but they don't overheat in the same way that males do nearly as quickly. So they're not as bulky, they're much more agile, and they're capable of sustaining their speed of their attack for a little bit longer than the males might be. They also tend to be the primary hunters or providers for the pride, which means they need to hunt fairly regularly, especially as the, prey, as the pride gets larger and larger. They need to hunt for some large prize every day or two, depending on what they're catching. Does that mean that they are more efficient hunters? It depends on the size of the prey. So a female with, sorry guys, just bear with me one moment. It's just another vehicle entering the sighting and I think he's been trying to call me. Sorry, Jilly, be with you in one moment. Right, so 
the prey selection in terms of the prides for these four females, they'll tend to go, as I said earlier, for something like a sub-adult buffalo or any kind of other prey species slightly smaller than that. As soon as you involve a male within a hunting pride, they immediately start to target bigger animals. And that can be anything from a large dugger boy or a large buffalo bull right up to the point of a giraffe in different instances. Now the males are not necessarily less efficient hunters and in fact they spend a considerable period of time on their own and hunting for themselves. And the Birmingham boys are a prime example of such an, or the ability of the males to hunt all by themselves. And very often they will take the lion's share of the meal, which seems fairly unfair if you look at it from an external or an objective perspective, the fact that they get to watch the hunt take place and then divest the females of their kills. But the reason behind that is that they're actually the protectors of the pride. They're, and that entails moving huge distances, patrolling enormous territories, marking and calling repeatedly, and probably actually have more energy demanding lifestyles than the females seem to do. So it's easy to oversimplify and to say that that seems so grossly unfair, but actually due to their, their biological role and their physiological adaptations, so they've got that huge mane that overheats them, but is there for protection for fighting. It, it's, it's not necessarily the case that the males have the, what would we call it? We don't have the easy way out. Let's put it that way. That being said, most of the kills that I have seen have always been initiated by the females, but I think that's just because I've spent less time following male coalitions when they are not with the pride itself. It always astounds me how they manage to lie on top of each other. It cannot be terribly comfortable. It must be incredibly warm. Well, since not much is happening here, although hopefully they should get moving in the next few moments as it gets cooler, let's pop over to James for an update. Hello, everybody. Anybody my ball in the wrist? Sorry, excuse me. Let me just turn that down. Hello. Right. We're here at a beautiful wallow full of mud. And this is a completely natural waterhole. It's been made so probably by warthogs initially, then buffalo, I'm sure some rhino who have been through here, and I'm very sure that elephants come down here and put mud on themselves when they're hot in the day. But it is the most wonderful feeling to mix this glorious mud. Maybe not for everybody. Uh, there is a certain odour of a, um, an odour of a, a dung. As Andrew says, make excellent wall paint. And there are some warthog tracks around here. Now I've put this on my face, of course, because around the world, probably as we're speaking, there are countless human beings sitting in spas having disgusting, vile-smelling mud spread all about their persons because apparently it's really good for the skin. So we will see tomorrow morning whether the two patches under my eyes are in better condition than the rest of my face. I'm going to go with probably not. Um, I'm afraid we found the elephant tracks where the elephants had been, but I'm afraid the elephants seem to have gone away somewhere. So we're still looking but we're on our way back east towards Juma as we speak. Andrew, do you want some wall paint? No, thank you. No. I thought we were going to do a joint wall painting. I'm not a warrior. Ah, oh, you are, and all men are warriors. Are we find the face? I probably will. I'll probably break out into a horrific case of acne. Right, on we go. The mud smells like, well, it smells like mud, like clay, and smells very rich. And I just could not stop myself getting out to try and stir it. It just looks so wonderful. It is quite smelly, though. I think I might take it off my face. Try not 
begins in my eye. Right. I believe those kitties are still sleeping with a great enthusiasm. I'm glad they've calmed down, I must say. And it would seem they were probably doing some game counts, if that's what I've understood from what I've heard on the radio. They were doing game counts, and that's probably why they were a bit upset about life. question from Henry, who's in the United Kingdom. Hello, Henry. Henry, you want to know when wild dogs are on the hunt or any other animal is on the hunt and they take on an animal, say, an impala or a wildebeest like that one over there, and they start eating it almost alive. Now, lions will also do this. If the prey is big enough, they will simply start eating it. There's the wildebeest. No, Andrew, I'm sorry. Better view. Henry, you want to know if there's a point at which they stop feeling pain? Yes, I think there is, absolutely, and it's the same for human beings. If you're in, say, a, a gunfight or a battle, I mean, as a, as a soldier or something like that, if you're in the thick of the fight, you often won't even notice that you've been shot. Sometimes a, a limb can even be blown off and you won't feel a thing and until you kind of the adrenaline goes down and then you start to feel pain. Now, the same thing will happen with animals out here. They start experience such trauma, their adrenaline gets to such an extent that I don't think they feel a thing. Once they get into it, they don't make a noise. A buffalo will bellow if it's being killed by lions because it's, that's normally a very slow process. But wild dogs and an impala, I think they don't feel anything at all except terror. I don't think they feel pain, but they certainly feel enough terror. Uh, sometimes don't know which is worse. But that is the way of things, I'm afraid. But I don't think that they feel a tremendous... I don't think it's a torturous pain. Like my think Last question. Thank you, Henry. Taylor, you want to know if any of our parrot species are able to take to talk or say human words? I'm pretty sure they could if you caught them. Um, they obviously, I've never had a wild one fly overhead and say, Pretty Polly, or put the kettle on. Polly wants a cracker. But I'm sure if you caught them, they could. Certainly some of the budgies and uh, lovebirds of natural species that I've seen that have been in cages can. Um, I'm not a particular fan of a caged bird. I know an African grey parrot, which come from the rainforests of Central Africa, they can certainly make human sounds. But there are other birds that can do it. And there's a, there's a, a bird that we saw at the dam a few day, a few months ago, I think now, an exotic bird called Indian Miner, which is sort of from the starling family, but it's from India and doesn't belong here. And if you catch them and, put, and spend, they spend enough time around human beings, they too can imitate human sounds. I think possibly more effectively even than our parrots out here. So we only get the brown-headed parrot here, and then Mayer's parrot further north, parrot down in the Cape, obviously, and a grey-headed parrot, I think, further towards sort of Natal. I don't know the distribution of the grey-headed parrot. But those are the parrot species we get here. And then we get three separate species of lovebirds in southern Africa. You're on Twitter and you want to know if we get chicken hawks and Andrew's wondering why I'm laughing. I'm laughing at that cartoon. I'm sure it was a cartoon with that enormous rooster and the minute chicken hawk. Um, anyway, we don't get... <laughs> it's an amusing cartoon. Pamela, we don't get anything called a chicken hawk here at all, no. I actually don't know what a chicken hawk is. I'm assuming it's an American bird that eats chickens. 
probably other ground dwelling fowl. No chicken hawks here. I'm trying to think what the closest, I mean, I guess the closest, closest relative would be something like a, a dark chanting goshawk, maybe, or an African goshawk. is a colloquial name for a, a quail hawk. So yes, it would be, if we don't get those exact birds, but it would be most closely to related to some of our occipital species, like the dark chanting goshawk, and the, well, we've got a few, the dark chanting goshawk, gabar goshawk, African goshawk, little sparrow hawk, maybe even a black sparrow hawk if you were really lucky. Andrew, are we trespassing? I'm just going to get out my, um, my map. You'll notice yesterday I said if you run out of those enormous bumps of Arethusa, Jerry's, Jerry's got a GPS feed and she says she reckon they were okay. okay. Suddenly I, here's one of the bumps. Really? Yes. You don't find those on some Bambili? Travel nut, you want to know if I have a background as a thespian in the theatre? Travel nut? No, I do not. Um, but some people have said that perhaps it was a better calling for me than the world of the wilderness. I have managed to infuse uh, my sort of propensity to theatrics in uh, various parts of my life, but no, I have no, um, no background in the theatre. I did think about it for some time, but unfortunately the theatre in South Africa, you either have to have a very large trust fund, or you have to accept that you're going to be very poor. Andrew, we're definitely just trespassing. This is one I've had. Not Arathusa to our left hand side, the gate to our north, Juma to the right. We're going to be turning right at the next available opportunity. I hope that nobody follows our tracks.
and as James tests his sense of direction and hopefully makes his way back towards Juma, we haven't moved. We are still with the lions. The lions, however, have moved. One of the, or the sub-adult got up and joined the rest of the adults and lay down again. He is twitching as they flick away the flies and poss quite possibly dream about the presence of the Birmingham boys as Valentine's Day approaches. Thank you, Cat and Tampa. <laughs> Oh, it's always interesting to sit with a sighting like this as an evening starts to draw to a close and just wonder a little bit about the ways in which the night is going to play out and what's going to happen. I noticed as soon as that sub-adult got up and moved slightly, already their bellies have started to shrink in size and it's absolutely phenomenal how fast or how rapidly their digestive process works to allow them to process those huge amounts of protein and fat and even bits of bone and be fully digested when you think how much they eat in one sitting and how distended their stomachs become they really are a marvel of engineering being able to be adapted like that to take advantage of any opportunity to have a meal and to eat as much as they can as quickly as possible. Oh, somebody found a thorn there, I think. Not the most comfortable position. Stretching out. And it's also... Now, Marcel, who is joining us for the very first time and would like to know a little bit about how this live stream works. Well, first of all, Marcel, a very warm welcome. It's wonderful to have you on board with us on our live safaris, and we hope that you continue to watch us. Now, Marcel, I'm probably the worst person to ask that question to, but I can sort of explain to you how our whole process works. We sit on a vehicle with a cameraman, and in this case it's Brian, who is behind us operating the camera and bringing you all of those incredible shots. And it's easy to underestimate, or shouldn't be, but I think sometimes it does happen that you underestimate exactly how much skill our cameramen have to have in filming live safaris, because not only do they have to have the camera knowledge, but they also have to have that background knowledge and be able to predict what the animals are going to do so that they can get there ahead of time. There's no second chances on a live safari, which is why we're so fortunate to have the team that we have here at the moment and why we're all, as a group, incredibly grateful to have each other. It is not just the presenter who is operating, but the cameraman at the back, as well as the ladies in FC who watch several different screens. At the moment, it's two, but it can go up to five. So at the moment, it's James and myself out. But we have in the past had up to five different streams with a live walk, a tent with a microscope, as well as a drone feed to give you some amazing aerial perspectives of the place that we are. Right, now Marcel, that is where my practical knowledge pretty much ends. I know that the ladies in FC, they're busy communicating to us through a radio, through an earpiece, and that is how your questions and your comments come through to us that you send through and they also make decisions as to where they want to be and what they, what sort of, what design they want the show to have. Technologically, Marcel, I can only really ask Brian to show you vaguely what is on the back of our vehicle. Can I do that, Brian? Yep. Now, we have a huge amount of technology that sits in the back. All of it has mysterious purposes to me. Luckily, we have Eugene and Mr. Alex Voz to help us out. There you go, there's our antenna that broadcasts the signal. As far as I know, it goes to a repeater first and then is sent back towards our systems and up into a satellite. Apparently, we've got three repeaters on the property itself and they link up to a satellite and beam it across the globe and right up towards London and then that is distributed across to the USA and the rest of the world. And we have viewers watching from Japan to Finland to Iceland to New Zealand, the 
parts of South Africa and mostly generally um, people watching in the States, which is absolutely incredible that we can reach so many people in such a wide ranging field. It's something that I love to be able to share a place that I am so passionate about and the creatures that I'm so passionate about is truly a fortunate experience. <coughs> Marcel, I wish I could give you a more technological explanation. Unfortunately, I'm probably one of the most technologically challenged people who work at Wild Earth. I'll have to do some brushing up on my knowledge of tricasters and all kinds of things that we have going on. And there we go. Calvin sitting all the way in Toronto and Canada is watching us and just thinking how amazing it is that he can be sitting in Canada and watching a lion pride on a Juma in South Africa. And you just wanted to know, Calvin, how many lion prides do we have on Juma? Well, between Juma and Arethusa, which is the area that we can generally drive around on, the main two prides that I would say we see the most are the Nkuhuma pride, so the, the females that you're looking at now, as well as the Styx Pride. Well, we went through a period where we also saw a pride known as the Salalas, which consisted of two females and three sub-adult males that had been displaced as a, an, over, an over -reach, far reaching effect of the Birmingham boy takeover. The Birminghams came in, pushed the Matimbas out, the Matimba males moved south, and actually had quite a negative impact on the Salalas, who then tried to rush up towards Arethusa and unfortunately found themselves within the reach of the Birmingham boys and rush, rushed back down south again. There's also the Telemati pride, which is further to the north of us in Buffels Hook, but those are generally the main prides that you most likely will see. Oh, and I forgot one, the poor Shemungwe pride. The Shemungwe pride, all of the adults have been killed in one way or another, either by other lions or by encounters with hyenas. Well, big cuddle and a roll. <laughs> and it now consists of just two sub-adult females and one very thin-looking sub-adult male, last time I saw him. Extreme survivors and very, very in incredible story. Definitely the underdogs of our live safari world. And then, of course, the Birmingham Boy Coalition, and occasionally, once in my memory of my time here at Juma, the Salati Male Coalition, two very large, beautiful males that generally are around Buffles Hook and Manuleti. Those are the lion prides that you are most likely to encounter on our live safari, but it being a live safari and us never knowing exactly what's going to happen, you never know who might decide to pop in, particularly from Kruger, where there are all kinds of prides that we have yet to encounter and now that the water has become less and less frequent or access to water has become less frequent there's a good chance that prides start might start to push in from the east of our position and already one bride has made an appearance a couple of times at Buffles Hook it doesn't have a name as far as we know it hasn't been identified yet but interesting times lie ahead for the lions of the Sabi Sands and the lions of the greater Kruger area. Um, an area that is famous for some of the most spectacular big cut sightings around the world, and particularly with the case of lions, has the most lions the, or the highest distribution of lions in the world, or the highest concentration, sorry, distribution is the wrong word, the highest concentration of lions in the entire world. Uh, Jared, I've kept a lookout for your, <laughs> for your bird, and I heard a Cokie Franklin. Jared, I don't know if you've seen a Cokie Franklin yet. I've been desperately looking in the hope that it will come stumbling past us, but unfortunately no sign, and I think the lions, presence of the lions has maybe discouraged it from wandering through. So far, for our regular viewers who monitor our lions very closely, we've done a close look at most of their bellies. There's no sign of any pregnancy yet. So those initial estrus cycles that they went through with the Birmingham boys, as we expected, and Billy in Texas in particular, I know you were asking. As we expected, those initial estrus cycles in which the females were mating with the males 
all of those were false estrous cycles, which is fairly typical, fairly normal for standard lion behavior. There's no sign of swollen, swollen nipples just yet. And generally right towards the late stage of their pregnancy, they might get a bit of a waxy coating around the nipple itself. And there's no sign of that just yet. But you never know. There's months to go. But in the meantime, James has found a tiny little animal to show you. Well, I mean, it's relatively tiny, I suppose. It's a little baby elephant. And it's the elephant we've been seeing. Its mum has the chopped off trunk. And those, I think, are its siblings. Look, isn't that wonderful? There's mum, just going to get a bit of comfort from mum. Oh, that's so wonderful. Oh, time. And there's the cut, cut off trunk. And we had a question the other day about, I don't think it was this chopped off trunk elephant, I think it was another one, about whether or not she will struggle to eat these little plants on the ground. Well, yes, I think she probably will. Look, it's trying to suckle. Look, she's still managing to use that trunk to pick, there's the answer, to pick up the plants. You can see the little elephant's elbow. Can you see that? Obvious elbow joint there. Oh, this is spectacular. Wonderful way to end our afternoon. hear the slurping noises the little one's making. The other youngster's reversing into its mother. That, that, so if we look at the, the herd in its entirety, there are four of them, they're worth three. And if there isn't one, if one of them isn't a, a sibling, at least a, a youngster of the big cow there, it's that one there. I'm pretty sure the other one is. So the, the slightly smaller one there on the right-hand side, not the right-hand, that one, I think that one is probably a sibling of the very small one. I think the middle one there is either a, an older sibling, although the mother doesn't look old enough to have a youngster that age. So that one actually could be a sibling of the mother, so an aunt to the other two. That's my guess. Most useless at this stage, and much easier. <laughs> so sweet. All right, everybody, that's it from Andrew and I today. Pretty, we found these ones so late. Sorry about that. Um, big thank you to all of you for your wonderful questions and comments. As always, you really do make some of these quieter drives just fantastic learning experiences for me, and I thank you for that. Thanks for watching, and we're going to hand you back to Jamie and Brian for the last few minutes. A big thank you first to Kirsty and to Geraldine, whose birthday it is tomorrow in the final control. Thank you, Andrew, for your efforts. Well done. It's back to Jamie and Brian, and we'll see you tomorrow. As the evening draws to a close, it carries with it a special smell out here in the African bush that I'm not quite sure how I would explain it to you. And this year it's been not quite the typical summer smell. It's been a dry and dusty impression that in fact has given quite a few crew members the sneezes at the moment with the wind swirling and the dust flying up our noses. But nevertheless, there is a stillness that descends and a, a smell that descends over the African bush that is quite indescribable. And a long night lies ahead for these lionesses. I wonder where they will decide to go and what they will decide to do. And we'll just have to wait for the sunrise safari tomorrow morning to find out. And who knows who might be out and about. 
the prospect of leopards and wild dogs and all kinds of wondrous creatures. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a pleasure as always, and it's fantastic having you on board, getting all of your questions and your comments through, and we really do appreciate it. Thank you as always to the wonderful Brian for his spectacular camera work, and the lovely Jerry and Kirsty in final control, and Eugene dealing with our technical side of things. Have a fantastic day, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. We'll catch you tomorrow. Cheers.